Dear listeners, this evening, I invite you to step into a world full of magic and mystery, where we will discover a captivating story about courage, sacrifice, and the power of friendship. Sit back comfortably, close your eyes, and let the story carry you into an enchanted world where a clever detective and his intelligent cat face the forces of darkness to protect a magical city. The Cat Who Knew Too Much Nocturnal Adventures in Eldoria Once upon a time, in a bygone era, when humans and creatures lived in harmony with magic and mystery, Eldoria, the magical and enigmatic city, was enveloped in an aura of fascination. In those times, on its cobblestone streets, lantern lights danced in the night shadows, and the old buildings held secrets of past eras. Felix, a renowned detective, and Whiskers, his intelligent cat, were known throughout the city for their ability to solve the most complicated puzzles. The story begins on a rainy evening, when the two heroes were enjoying their tea by the steamy window of their office. The rain gently tapped on the windows, and Felix and Whiskers, comfortably seated by the warm stove, listened intently to the soothing sound of raindrops. In this quiet setting, they were worriedly discussing the rumors heard earlier that day. Rumors about an ancient prophecy that disturbed the peace of Eldoria. It was said that the animals in the city possessed special knowledge, and that this knowledge was in imminent danger. Felix, with a focused and determined look, slowly sipped his tea, savoring each sip while his gaze was lost in the dance of the rain on the window. Whiskers, with her bright green eyes, seemed to reflect on what she had heard, sitting quietly by the stove, with her ears tense and her tail swaying slowly. For a few moments, both remained silent, absorbed in their thoughts. We need to find out more about this prophecy, Felix said, breaking the silence, slowly getting up and putting on his detective hat with a firm gesture. He straightened his coat and looked at Whiskers, who, sensing the change in tone, agilely jumped onto his shoulder, signaling that she was ready to start the investigation. Felix smiled briefly, whispering, Come on, my friend. We have work to do. With determination etched on their faces, Felix and Whiskers left the office, ready to face the rainy night and the mysteries that awaited them. Their first stop was an old bookstore, covered in the dust of time, located in a forgotten corner of the city. The bookstore, with shelves full of old books and yellowed parchments, was a true sanctuary of knowledge. Felix and Whiskers slowly stepped inside, feeling the smell of old paper and ink. In a dark corner of the bookstore, they met Athena, a wise owl with snow-white feathers and large, golden eyes that seemed to see beyond the present. Athena looked at them with a grave and profound expression. I was expecting you, she said, in a soothing but serious voice. Athena revealed to them an ancient prophecy, carefully preserved over generations. The prophecy warned that a powerful wizard named Mortis intended to capture the magical essence of the animals to gain absolute control over Eldoria. Felix and Whiskers listened intently to every word, realizing the gravity of the situation. 
Mortis is dangerous, Athena said in a grave voice. He will not stop until he gets what he wants. You must stop him before it's too late. Armed with this vital information, Felix and Whiskers decided to immediately start searching for more answers. Their determination was unshakable. They knew that Eldoria and its inhabitants, both human and animal, depended on their courage and ingenuity to protect the city's knowledge and magic from evil forces. Leaving the bookstore, the rain continued to fall gently, and the streets were bathed in a diffuse light reflected by the puddles on the cobblestones. Felix and Whiskers went on, guided by a sense of duty and the desire to protect Eldoria. Behind them, Athena remained in the bookstore's shadow, observing with wisdom and hope in her eyes. Felix and Whiskers, now having a clear mission to protect Eldoria, decided to venture deep into the heart of this enchanting city. Their goal was to reach a magical place known as the Garden of Whispers. It was said that this garden was a sanctuary of secrets and ancient mysteries, a place where the past and the future met in secret whispers carried by the wind. As they approached the Garden of Whispers, the atmosphere around them became increasingly quiet and mysterious. Walking through arches of lush vegetation, Felix and Whiskers felt the magic of the place gradually enveloping them. The leaves rustled gently as if whispering long-forgotten secrets, and the air was perfumed with the pleasant scent of night flowers. In the middle of the garden, under the pale moonlight, there was a venerable turtle named Teratus. With a shell sculpted by time and deep, wise eyes, Teratus was a guardian of the garden's secrets. Felix and Whiskers slowly approached her, respecting the quietness and sacredness of the place. Greetings, Teratus, Felix said respectfully. Whiskers sat beside him, looking at the turtle with interest. We are here to seek answers. We have heard that you hold visions of the future. Teratus slowly raised her head and looked at them with a deep expression of wisdom. Felix, Whiskers, she began, her deep and soothing voice resonating in the air. My vision is not only about the future, but also about the present and past of Eldoria. I have been expecting you. Mortis and the shadows of the eclipse are putting their evil plans into action. As Tarata spoke, images began to form in Felix and Whiskers' minds. They saw how Mortis, a powerful wizard, and his group of dark followers, the shadows of the eclipse, plotted to capture the magical essence of the animals in Eldoria. Their plans threatened to destroy the delicate balance of the city, and the future seemed grim and full of dangers. There is a dangerous conspiracy threatening Eldoria, Tarata said in a grave voice. You must find the Oracle's Purr, a secret gathering of wise cats. Only there will you be able to fully understand the nature of this threat and learn how to face it. Felix and Whiskers immediately accepted the challenge. They thanked the turtle for her wisdom and set off in search of the oracle's purr, knowing that their path would be filled with obstacles and unknown dangers. As they left the Garden of Whispers, a heavy silence fell, and the shadows of the night seemed to dance in the moonlight. Every step 
was accompanied by the light rustle of leaves, as if the garden itself wished them luck on their journey. Felix and Whiskers walked shoulder to shoulder, ready to face any challenge that might come their way. On their way to the Oracle's Purr, they reached an old bridge, covered in moss and surrounded by murky waters. The bridge was known for its old traps, left by those who protected Eldoria's secrets. Felix and Whiskers immediately sensed the presence of hidden danger. The bridge seemed fragile, and beneath it, the murmuring water seemed to hide unknown creatures. Felix quickly analyzed the bridge's structure and noticed some wooden planks that seemed more worn than others. Whiskers, be careful with those planks, he said. Whiskers flicked her tail in understanding and agilely jumped onto the first safe plank. Felix followed carefully, calculating each step. Halfway across, a sharp noise was heard from one side of the bridge. Felix noticed a quick movement under the water. An old trap was activated, raising a mechanical arm that tried to grab them. Whiskers was quicker, elegantly jumping over the trap and landing on the safe side of the bridge. Felix, with a swift movement, avoided the mechanical arm and managed to cross safely. Once on the other side, Felix and Whiskers caught their breath, feeling the adrenaline in every fiber of their bodies. We made it, Felix said, smiling at Whiskers. Another obstacle overcome. The Garden of Whispers remained behind but its secret whispers echoed in their minds, constantly reminding them of the importance of their mission. With each step, Felix and Whiskers drew closer to the Oracle's purr and the answers they needed to face the threat posed by Mortis and the shadows of the Eclipse. In this moonless night, the city of Eldoria seemed to be in a deep and peaceful sleep. But for Felix and Whiskers, the adventures were far from over. The night was silent, with only a few whispers of the wind passing through the dark streets, guiding them to their next destination, the basement of an old building where the Oracle's purr was located. Between the dark and shadowed walls of this building was the secret gathering of wise cats who possessed the knowledge needed to face the imminent danger. Felix and Whiskers sneaked past the old buildings, avoiding the lit areas and navigating through the protective shadows. Reaching the designated building, they found a heavy door, partially covered by ivy and moss which seemed to lead to the basement. Felix slowly pushed the door, and the metallic creak of the hinges broke the night silence, revealing a narrow and dark staircase leading into the depths of the building. Descending carefully step by step, they reached a vast room, dimly lit by a few strategically placed candles. Here, in the mysterious penumbra was Mustas, a clairvoyant cat with bright eyes, whose penetrating gaze welcomed them. Her eyes reflected deep wisdom and an understanding of the secrets of time and destiny. Felix, Whiskers, Mustas said in a calm and determined voice, you have arrived just in time. Mortis intends to manipulate time to control our city. To complete his plan, he needs the Knight's Eye, an ancient and extremely powerful amulet. Felix and Whiskers looked at each other, immediately understanding the gravity of the situation. 
they knew they had no time to lose. Finding the amulet before Mortis got his hands on it was essential to saving Eldoria. With renewed determination, they asked Mustas for guidance, who provided them with information about the amulet's location. The knight's eye is hidden in an abandoned temple, protected by dangerous traps and magical creatures, explained Mustas. You will face perils there, but I am confident you will overcome them. With these words of encouragement, Felix and Whiskers set off on a race against time. Their path took them through the dark catacombs of the city, where shadows seemed to come to life and follow them at every step. The damp and cold walls of the catacombs were decorated with old and mysterious symbols, and the sounds of their footsteps echoed menacingly in the darkness. As they advanced through the dark and mysterious catacombs, Felix and Whiskers found themselves in front of a massive gate, covered with old inscriptions and arcane signs. Felix quickly studied the inscriptions and realized it was an incantation meant to seal the gate. With his knowledge of symbolism, he recited the necessary counter-incantation to open the gate, revealing a hidden passage through which they could cross the catacombs. Exiting the catacombs, Felix and Whiskers found themselves on the slippery rooftops of Eldoria. Each misstep could lead to a deadly fall, and the warmth of the catacombs was quickly replaced by the intense cold of the night. The city streets stretched far below them, with diffuse lights flickering like fireflies in the darkness. The moon, hidden behind thick clouds, offered no light. The only source of light was the pale reflection of the stars, barely revealing the dangerous contours of the rooftops. The cold and strong wind blew mercilessly, making it even harder to maintain balance. Each gust seemed to push them toward the edge of the buildings, where darkness and void awaited to swallow them. Felix extended his hand to ensure each time he placed his foot on a new surface, feeling the slippery texture of the wet tiles. Whiskers, with her cat agility, moved faster, but with the same caution, making sure each leap was precisely calculated. Together, they formed a perfectly synchronized team, each compensating for the other's weaknesses. In a moment of pause, Felix and Whiskers stopped on a more stable part of the roof. Their breaths were heavy, warm steam being taken away by the cold wind. We're almost there, Felix whispered, encouraging himself, but also Whiskers. The cat nodded approvingly, her green eyes reflecting determination and courage. After a journey full of perils and challenges, Felix and Whiskers finally reached their destination, the abandoned temple where the ancient amulet, the Night's Eye, was hidden. The temple, a relic of a long-gone era, stood in the heart of a dense and dark forest, shrouded in the silence and mystery of the night. Pale moonlight slipped through the cracks in the walls, creating playful shadows and giving the entire place a mysterious air. Felix and Whiskers advanced with cautious steps, aware that they were not alone. The entire atmosphere was charged with tension, and every corner of the temple seemed to hide a new danger. Reaching the main hall, 
their gazes were drawn to an intense glow in the middle of the room. The night's eye amulet was placed on an old pedestal, emanating a powerful and hypnotizing light. But they were not the only ones who had noticed it. Mortis and his followers were already waiting, ready to confront them. Mortis, with a frightening presence and eyes gleaming with malice, smiled ironically when he saw Felix and Whiskers. You have no chance, he said in a grave, confident voice. The night's eye will be mine, and with it, I will control time and Eldoria. Felix and Whiskers, not letting themselves be intimidated, responded with determination. Eldoria will not fall under your power, Mortis, Felix said firmly. We are here to stop you. In the pale moonlight, a dramatic confrontation began. Felix and Whiskers used all their skills to face the forces of darkness. Mortis, with his wizard powers, invoked spirits and shadows that attacked from all sides. But Felix, with his sharp mind and quick reflexes, always found a way to counter each attack. Whiskers, agile and intelligent, slipped between the enemies, distracting them and striking with precision. The battle was intense, and every second counted. Felix and Whiskers had to coordinate perfectly to withstand the relentless attacks. In a moment of inspiration, Whiskers saw an opportunity. With astounding speed, she slipped between the shadows and spirits, reaching the pedestal where the amulet was placed. With a quick and precise move, Whiskers grabbed the amulet its glow reflecting in her green eyes. Feeling the magical power emanating from the amulet, Whiskers knew exactly what to do. With fierce determination, she used the knight's eye to counter Mortis's spells. A powerful light filled the room, revealing and destroying the forces of darkness with the pure magic of the amulet. Mortis, defeated and stripped of his powers, fell to the ground, unable to fight any longer. Time was restored, and Eldoria was saved from destruction. Felix and Whiskers, triumphant, watched as the shadows dissipated, and silence returned to the temple. Their mission had been successfully completed. After saving the city, Felix and Whiskers returned to their usual life. The detective and his intelligent cat were ready for new adventures, knowing that at any moment they could be called upon to protect the magical city again. Whenever a new threat appeared on the horizon, Felix and Whiskers would be ready to use their skills and courage to defend Eldoria and its inhabitants. And that, dear listeners, was the cat who knew too much, showing us that true power comes from the courage to face the unknown and the determination to protect what we love. So remember that behind every act of courage there may be a hero, and in every silence, a story waiting to be discovered. If you enjoyed tonight's story, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to never miss a magical tale. Until next time, have sweet dreams and magical adventures every night. Dear listeners, tonight I invite you to step into a fairy tale world where courage and hope reveal unparalleled mysteries and adventures.
sit comfortably, close your eyes, and let the story transport you to a magical village where wishes are fulfilled by an enchanted lantern, and magic transforms the loneliest hearts. The Lantern of Wishes A Thrilling Adventure in a time when magic still roamed the lands, when stories came to life, and hope sprouted in the hearts of both young and old, there existed a place of rare beauty where nature and legends intertwined harmoniously. In those ancient days, in the picturesque village of Evershine, nestled between green hills and mysterious forests, lived a young orphan named Rowan. Evershine was a charming little village, with ivy-covered stone houses and narrow paths winding through fields of wildflowers. Its inhabitants were warm-hearted and hard-working people who appreciated both the simplicity of life and the small miracles that happened daily around them. The village was renowned for the Festival of Lights, an annual celebration where a magical lantern, bright as a fallen star, granted one true wish. Rowan, a young man with bright eyes and ebony black hair, had been raised by the elderly Mrs. Agnes, a woman with snow-white hair and kind eyes, who had always treated him as her own grandson. Despite the love and care from Mrs. Agnes, Rowan felt in his heart that he did not truly belong. The absence of a real family gnawed at him every day, and loneliness was like a dark cloud constantly hovering over his head. Each year during the festival, Rowan would watch the magical lantern with a heavy heart, hoping his wish would be granted. Year after year, he silently whispered his wish with closed eyes and a hopeful soul. I wish for a family to love and accept me. But each time, the lantern seemed not to hear his pleas, and Rowan remained alone with his unfulfilled wish. This time, however, Rowan was determined to do more than just hope. He planned to embark on a journey to find the enchanted lantern himself. He could no longer wait passively, hoping his wish would be fulfilled without effort. He felt he needed to act, to take his destiny into his own hands. So, on a crisp autumn morning, with a heart full of determination, Rowan packed his bags and set off toward the dark forest at the edge of the village, a place known for its magical and capricious creatures. The dark forest was a mysterious place, often avoided by the villagers. It was said to be home to forest spirits, capricious fairies, and other magical creatures, some benevolent, others not so much. But Rowan was not deterred. He knew that within the depths of the forest lay the answer to his wish, and he was ready to face any danger to find it. His path through the forest was filled with obstacles, but also moments of revelation and wisdom. As he moved forward, Rowan felt that each step brought him closer to the enchanted lantern and the fulfillment of his wish. Each fallen leaf under his feet, each mysterious sound of the forest, each breeze strengthened his resolve. On the first day of his journey, the forest greeted him with a deep, almost oppressive silence. The sun barely penetrated through the dense branches of the trees, and long shadows drew bizarre shapes on the moss covered ground and dry leaves. Rowan stepped carefully, 
listening to every sound, alert to every movement around him. The air was filled with the scent of damp earth and wet leaves, a mix that sent shivers down his spine, but also filled him with an unbridled curiosity. As he delved deeper into the forest, Rowan began to notice signs of magical presence. Here and there, shimmering butterflies danced in the air, leaving behind a fine powder that sparkled in the sunlight. On the tree trunks, phosphorescent lichens drew intricate patterns, and in the air was heard the melodious song of unseen birds. Every detail seemed to tell a story, and Rowan felt he was part of a fairy tale world. Despite the forest's mysterious beauty, Rowan knew he had to be vigilant. The magical creatures were capricious, and the lurking dangers were real. He remembered the stories told by the village elders about those who entered the forest and never returned. But instead of frightening him, these stories gave him courage. He felt that deep within him, he had the strength to overcome any obstacle. As day turned into night, the forest became darker and more mysterious. The daylight gradually faded, giving way to shadows that stretched and danced on the ground. Rowan lit a small hand lantern that cast a warm and comforting light. That light gave him strength and reminded him of his purpose to find the magical lantern and fulfill his wish. Before settling in for the night, Rowan found a small clearing where he decided to lay out his blanket and set up a temporary shelter. Under the starry sky, with the soothing sounds of the forest around him, the young man let his thoughts wander. He thought of Mrs. Agnes, the village of Evershine, and the enchanted lantern. In his mind, he saw the image of a loving family with whom to spend his life, and he felt that his dream was closer than ever. Falling asleep under the starry sky, with his hand lantern gently glowing, Rowan knew that the next day would bring new challenges and discoveries. But with a heart full of hope and determination, he was ready to face them all. His adventures had only just begun, and the forest's magic had much to reveal. The next day, Rowan continued his journey through the forest, feeling each step as an incursion into a world of fairy tale and danger. During the day, the forest's noises were relatively harmless. Birds sang cheerful melodies, and the wind whispered through the leaves. However, as night fell, the atmosphere became increasingly oppressive. The sounds of the forest transformed into mysterious whispers and frightening noises that seemed to come from all directions. One night, as the darkness grew denser, Rowan was startled by the mysterious sounds of the forest. He stopped abruptly, trying to calm his breathing and soothe his heart, which was pounding. It seemed that the shadows of the trees were moving, stretching menacingly towards him. In that tense moment, a wise owl descended from a tall tree and let out a powerful cry that silenced the surroundings. Only those with a pure heart and true wishes can find the lantern, the owl said. Her large, bright eyes seemed to penetrate Rowan's soul. Guided by the owl's words and his burning desire, Rowan continued his path. Each step was a test of courage, and Rowan felt that every moment brought him closer to his goal. 
As he advanced, Rowan encountered various obstacles. He had to use his wits and courage to overcome each challenge. One day, while crossing a crystal clear stream, he was drawn by the enchanting song of a siren who tried to lure him into the depths of the water. The siren's song was of hypnotic beauty, a sweet, bitter melody that enveloped his mind and made his feet step involuntarily towards the water's edge. Rowan felt how each musical note invaded his thoughts, clouded his judgment, and weakened his will. Each moment spent near that, Melody brought him closer to the dangerous edge of the stream. With great difficulty resisting the temptation, Rowan managed to gather his strength and break free from the siren's spell, remembering his purpose. An inner voice whispered to him to stay strong, not to fall prey to fleeting temptations. His goal was far too important to be abandoned for a passing illusion. With his breath still ragged and his heart pounding, Rowan continued his journey, more determined than ever. On a foggy morning, he encountered a fragile bridge spanning a deep chasm. Though it seemed impossible to cross, Rowan remembered the advice of the elderly Mrs. Agnes, her wise words about courage and determination. Don't be discouraged by appearances, she often told him. True courage comes from the heart and mind. Look ahead and take the first step with confidence. With these words in mind, Rowan stepped onto the bridge, focusing on his goal and not the danger below. Each step was calculated and filled with confidence, and the bridge, though fragile, held firm under his determined steps. Crossing the chasm, Rowan felt that each step brought him closer to the magical lantern. Another day, Rowan had to navigate through a maze of vines, with sharp thorns and twisted paths. He recalled the stories told by the village elders about heroes who used their wits to overcome the most dangerous traps. Sometimes, the old Merrick told him, the safest path is not the easiest. Use your mind and intuition to find the right way. With the help of these teachings, Rowan managed to find the right path and avoid the hidden traps. Each victory filled him with confidence and hope strengthening his desire to find the lantern and fulfill his dream. At night, when fatigue set in and the forest's dangers seemed even more frightening, Rowan found refuge in an improvised shelter under an old tree. In those moments of quiet, with only the forest's sounds in the background, his thoughts flew to Evershine and the elderly Mrs. Agnes. He remembered the evening spent by the fire, listening to her stories about courage and hope. Courage, she told him, is not the absence of fear, but the strength to move forward despite it. These memories gave him strength and motivated him to continue. The leaves of the forest rustled under his feet and each step seemed to bring him closer to his destiny. One evening, when the sky was draped in a mantle of stars, and the moonlight shone gently through the trees, Rowan encountered a benevolent fairy. She was delicate and luminous, with translucent wings that seemed to capture every ray of light. Good evening, Rowan, she said in a gentle voice, like the murmur of a stream. I have been watching you since you entered the forest. 
and I admire your courage. I have something for you. With a graceful gesture, the fairy handed him a small, but glowing talisman. This talisman will protect you from the dangers that await you, she continued, smiling warmly. It will guide your steps and give you the strength to overcome the trials that will come. Your path leads to the ancient ruins of a forgotten temple, where you will find what you seek. Rowan received the talisman with gratitude, feeling a soothing energy envelop him. Thank you, kind fairy, he said feeling his heart filled with renewed hope. With the talisman around his neck, he continued his journey toward the ruins, guided by his inner light and the promise of magical protection. Finally, he reached the ruins of the Forgotten Temple. The landscape was of solemn and mysterious beauty. Shadows danced on the stone walls, and the air was charged with magic. Each stone seemed to carry the story of a long-lost time, and Rowan felt an ancient and powerful presence around him. The Forgotten Temple was a place of enigmas and mysteries, and the young man knew his trials were only beginning. As he explored the ruins, Rowan felt the talisman vibrate slightly, as if warning him of a hidden power. Soon, he came upon an enchanted fountain, whose clear water shimmered in the dim light. Gazing into its depths, Rowan saw visions of his painful past. The faces of loved ones, moments of loneliness and suffering, all reflected in the water. His heart ached at the sight of these images, but he knew he had to confront them. Leaning over the fountain, Rowan let his tears flow, accepting each memory and pain. In that moment, he understood that only by accepting his past could he move forward. The fountain, recognizing his courage and sincerity, calmed its waters, revealing a new path ahead. As he advanced, Rowan encountered a magical labyrinth where the walls moved and the corridors seemed never-ending. Every turn was a trap, and each misstep brought him back to the starting point. With the talisman glowing faintly, Rowan remembered the fairy's words. The talisman will guide you. Closing his eyes and breathing deeply, he let his intuition lead him step by step, guided by his inner light and the talisman's protection, Rowan found the correct path. Each trial overcome strengthened his conviction that his wish was about to be fulfilled. The magical labyrinth, though full of traps and illusions, seemed to test more than his physical abilities. It was a test of heart and mind, of desire, and perseverance. Finally, after traversing the last turn of the labyrinth, Rowan arrived in a vast chamber, illuminated by a gentle and warm light. In the center of the chamber, on a stone pedestal, was the enchanted lantern. Its glow was dazzling, emanating a warmth that penetrated deep into Rowan's soul. With trembling hands, the young man approached the lantern. His entire journey seemed to have prepared him for this moment. He felt that every step, every obstacle overcome, and every lesson learned had brought him here, before this magical artifact. Placing his hands on the lantern, Rowan voiced his wish aloud. I wish for a family to love and accept me. In that moment of pure magic, the lantern shone with a blinding light, filling the chamber with a divine glow. Rowan felt an unseen force envelop him, transporting
transporting him back to the village of Evershine. It was as if he had been lifted by an invisible hand and carried through time and space with ease that defied all laws of nature. When Rowan regained his senses, he found himself in the midst of his beloved village, surrounded by villagers who awaited him with open arms. The familiar faces of the people lit up with joy and wonder, their eyes glistening with tears of happiness. The lantern's magic had touched them all, making them realize how much Rowan meant to them and how empty the village would be without him. The elderly Mrs. Agnes, with her kind eyes and trembling hands, embraced Rowan tightly, tears streaming down her cheeks. My dear boy, she said, her voice laden with emotion. I have always loved you as my own grandson. You are part of my family. Farmer Tom, with his strong hands and deep voice, said, Rowan, we have always needed your help. Your work is valuable, and your presence brings light into our lives. Even the village children, who already considered him a close friend, gathered around him, laughing and holding his hand, delighted to see him safe. Overwhelmed by the wave of affection and acceptance, Rowan felt his heart fill with a warmth he had never known. All the sacrifices and trials he had gone through now seemed like necessary steps to reach this moment of fulfillment. It was as if everything had been meant to bring him here, into the arms of a community that loved and cherished him. But that was not all. As he delved into the joy of the reunion, Rowan discovered an unexpected revelation. He learned that he was not just a simple orphan, but the descendant of an old and respected protector of the village. The lantern's magic had awakened a latent force within him, an ancient energy that had transformed him into a symbol of hope and unity for all in Evershine. The villagers spoke of a time when Evershine had been protected by a brave warrior whose legacy had been forgotten in the mists of time. Now, Rowan felt connected to this history, as if the lantern's magic had revealed his true identity and place in the world. This discovery brought him not only joy, but also a deep sense of responsibility and pride. That year's Festival of Lights was the grandest ever. Everyone in Evershine participated in the celebration, and Rowan's story became the central theme of the festival. The candles and lanterns shone more brightly, reflecting the happiness and gratitude of the villagers. The songs and dances were more joyful, and laughter could be heard late into the night. Rowan, with a heart full of joy, realized that he had finally found his long-desired family. Not through blood ties, but through bonds of love and respect that united all the villagers. Evershine had become a place where hope and magic were always present, and every villager felt part of a greater story, a story of courage, sacrifice, and the true value of community. That night, under the gentle light of the moon and the shining stars, Rowan lay down peacefully, knowing he had finally found his true place in the world. His sleep was light, and filled with beautiful dreams, and the next day promised new adventures and joys alongside his family in Evershine. Rowan's story was a testament to the power of magic and true love, a story 
that would live on forever in the hearts of those who believe in the power of fulfilled wishes. And so, dear listeners, we have reached the end of our magical adventure about the Lantern of Wishes. Remember, in every story lies a spark of magic, and in every brave heart, a wish waiting to be fulfilled. If you enjoyed this enchanting journey, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you never miss a new story full of wonders. What would you do if you had the chance to encounter a magical lantern? Would you dare to voice your deepest wish? Or would you keep the magic in your heart? Share your thoughts with us in the comments. Until next time, have sweet dreams and magical adventures every day and night. Dear listeners, tonight I invite you to step into a world of magic and courage, where mysteries and adventures intertwine in our story. Sit comfortably, close your eyes, and let the tale carry you into a silver forest where a magical wolf watches over nature. The Silver Wolf Magical Adventure in the Enchanted Forest In times when magic was part of the world's fabric and forests harbored secrets and wise creatures, there were people who could still communicate with nature and understand the secret language of the elements. In these magical times, it was natural for the destinies of mortals to intertwine with those of enchanted lands. In such a forest, known as the Silver Forest, lived a young girl named Rhea. Legends said that the forest was inhabited by protective spirits and magical creatures, hidden from the eyes of outsiders. Rhea, with her chestnut hair and bright eyes, had a special bond with nature. Raised in a village on the edge of the forest, she was taught by the elders to respect and protect the forest's magic. One quiet night, filled with the silence of nature, the sky was covered with a mantle of stars, and the full moon shone with a gentle silver light. Rhea lay in her simple bed, in her modest house at the edge of the silver forest. She had fallen asleep, thinking about the beauty of the forest, the murmuring of the streams, and the song of the birds, slowly drifting into dreams. However, that night would be different. In her dream, Rhea found herself in the middle of the forest, under the moonlight that seemed to flood everything with a magical aura. Suddenly, a silver wolf appeared from the shadows, moving with grace and dignity. Its fur gleamed with an unseen brightness, reflecting the moonlight, and its eyes shone like two distant stars, full of wisdom and peace. Rhea felt that this wolf was not an ordinary being. It radiated a calm and powerful energy, like an ancient guardian of the forest. The wolf approached Rhea without fear, and she felt an immediate connection, as if she had known it forever. With a calm and deep voice, the wolf spoke to her, introducing itself as Lycos, the guardian of the Silver Forest. Its voice was like a gentle echo through Rhea's mind, soothing her soul and giving her a sense of safety. Lycos began to tell her about the forest, about all the creatures that inhabited it, and the harmony that reigned there, a harmony he had protected for centuries. 
but his tone changed when he reached the main subject of their meeting. Lycos spoke of a serious threat on the horizon, a danger that could destroy the forest's delicate balance. A dark sorcerer named Moros planned to extract the magical essence of the forest, the source of its life and energy. Moros was not just an ordinary sorcerer. He fed on the power of darkness, on the dark forces that destroyed everything in their path. He sought to amplify his powers, even if it meant destroying the forest and upsetting the natural balance of the world. Rhea listened intently, feeling a weight in her heart at the thought of the danger threatening the place she loved so much. Lycos explained that only someone with a pure heart and a deep connection to nature could thwart Moros's plans. Rhea, with her rare ability to communicate with plants and animals, was the only hope. Lycos told her that to protect the forest, she needed to discover an ancient artifact known as the Heart of the Forest, which had the power to counter Moros's dark magic. As Lycos spoke, Rhea felt a wave of responsibility settle on her shoulders. She was not just an ordinary girl. The destiny of the forest and all its creatures depended on her actions. The Silver Wolf told her that this mission would not be easy. She would have to face many dangers, overcome obstacles, and confront her fears. But he also assured her that she would not be alone. The spirits of the forest would guide her, and he, Lycos, would be by her side, offering advice and protection. Lycos ended his story with a final warning. If the forest were lost, not only would the creatures and plants suffer, but the entire world would lose a part of its beauty and balance. Rhea needed to be brave and trust in herself, in her bond with nature, and in the help of her friends, both human and magical. Rhea awoke suddenly from her dream, her heart pounding in her chest. The memory of the silver wolf and his wise words was still fresh in her mind. As dawn began to light the horizon, Rhea knew there was no time to lose. Her clear and urgent vision pushed her to act immediately. The village where she lived, small and isolated at the edge of the silver forest, was known for its legends about the magic of the place. The people there lived in harmony with nature, respecting and loving every aspect of it. Although the villagers did not possess magical abilities like Rhea's, they were aware of the ancient stories that spoke of the spirits of the forest and the magical creatures that protected it. Raised with these stories, Rhea felt that she was now part of one of them. With determination, Rhea began to prepare for the journey ahead. She knew it would be a long and dangerous road, so she took only the essentials. A canvas bag with some provisions, a warm cloak, and a small knife for protection. The forest would provide the rest, as long as she respected and protected it. Lycos, the silver wolf who had appeared in her dream, now showed up in the real world, guiding and protecting her throughout the journey. With each step she took into the forest, Rhea felt a deeper connection to the place. As she advanced through the dense thickets, she discovered breathtaking landscapes and magical creatures that seemed to watch her with curiosity. Each encounter was a test and a lesson. 
At one point, Rhea came across an old, rickety rope bridge that spanned a deep ravine. As she carefully stepped on the fragile planks, a strong wind began to blow, causing the bridge to sway dangerously. With her heart in her throat, Rhea clung to the ropes, but found her balance by remembering her grandmother's teachings about courage and calm in the face of danger. As she progressed, Rhea met the protective spirits of the forest, ethereal and graceful beings who offered her advice and support. They spoke to her about the delicate balance that had to be maintained and the dangers that might arise. They explained that the forest itself was alive and felt every change and intention. These spirits saw in Rhea a trustworthy ally and decided to assist her in her mission. But not all encounters were friendly. One day, Rhea was attacked by a giant carnivorous plant hidden beneath the soft soil. With powerful roots and sharp thorns, the plant tried to ensnare her. Surprised and scared, Rhea managed to escape only thanks to her quick reflexes and Lycos's help, who bit fiercely at the roots to free her. This incident served as a clear reminder of the hidden dangers lurking at every turn. On another evening, as the sun set, Rhea came across a group of naiads, water spirits, dancing gracefully on the surface of a crystal clear lake. The naiads, with their long, shimmering hair like water, sang a hypnotic melody, trying to lure Rhea into their midst. Mesmerized by the beauty of their song and dance, Rhea almost forgot her mission. However, Lycos sensed the danger and barked, snapping Rhea out of her trance. Realizing she was about to be bewitched by the naiads, Rhea gathered her strength and gently refused their invitation to enter the water. The naiads, though disappointed, respected her decision and retreated into the depths of the lake, allowing Rhea to continue her journey. Despite these challenges, Rhea felt increasingly connected to the forest. Every corner of the forest seemed to speak to her, revealing its hidden secrets. She listened to the whispers of the wind through the leaves, the murmur of the waters, and the song of the birds, feeling the forest accepting her, recognizing her as one of its protectors. This feeling gave her strength and courage to continue, regardless of the obstacles that might arise. Rhea remembered Lycos's words about the dangers awaiting her. She knew that Moros would not stand idly by and would try to stop her. Nevertheless, she did not feel alone. Besides the support of the forest spirits, Lycos was always by her side, a constant and comforting presence. The wolf did not speak often, but when he did, his words were full of wisdom and guidance. Rhea felt grateful for this reliable ally and for the forest's trust in her. On a dark night, under a pale moon, Rhea ventured deeper into the silver forest. The wind blew fiercely, and the leaves rustled strangely, as if whispering warnings. Rhea felt a growing unease, and the shadows seemed to move on their own, creating a frightening atmosphere. Suddenly, from the shadow of the trees, a pack of black wolves appeared, different from those in the fairy tales of her childhood. Their eyes glowed with a menacing red light, and their movements were precise 
and coordinated, as if controlled by an external force. Rhea immediately understood that they were under Moros's influence. With her heart pounding wildly, Rhea tried to defend herself, but the number of wolves was overwhelming. In those moments of despair, Lycos appeared, more radiant and imposing than ever. The silver wolf positioned himself between Rhea and the dark wolves, emitting a gentle, but powerful light. With a warning howl, Lycos made the dark wolves hesitate. Rhea, feeling the courage emanating from Lycos, gathered her strength and began to recite a protection incantation she had learned from the forest spirits. The silver light of Lycos intensified, enveloping Rhea and repelling the dark creatures. The wolves, disoriented and frightened, eventually retreated, leaving Rhea safe. This encounter was just the beginning of her trials. As she continued to advance through the forest, Moros did not cease to hinder her. One day, Rhea reached a wide and turbulent river, whose waters were known for their ability to attract lost souls. On the opposite shore, a stone pathway led to the next part of the forest, but the only way to cross the river was a narrow and shaky bridge made of ropes and old planks. Rhea knew that a mistake could be fatal, but her determination was unwavering. With each step on the unstable bridge, she felt the wind trying to unbalance her and the planks cracking under her weight. When she was nearly halfway across, a giant wave rose from the river, threatening to knock her down. In those critical moments, Rhea remembered the advice from the forest spirits. Be one with nature. Let yourself be carried by its energy. She closed her eyes, took a deep breath, and felt the wind and water become her allies, not enemies. With unexpected grace, she managed to cross the bridge and reach the other side safely. On another occasion, Rhea was drawn to an abandoned village, where the houses were mere ruins covered with moss. The atmosphere was heavy and oppressive, and the silence was broken only by the sound of her steps. As she explored the place, she encountered a mysterious figure, an old man with a white beard and deep eyes. He told her that he was a forest spirit, a being who once protected the place, but was now bound to the land by a curse. He tried to convince Rhea to abandon her mission and stay in the village, saying that the outside world was full of dangers and she had no chance against Moros. Rhea felt a moment of doubt, but remembering Lycos and all the beings she had met in the forest, she regained her courage. She realized that the old man was actually an illusion created by Moros to discourage her. Refusing to give in to fear, she spoke words of release she had learned from the forest spirits. With a cry of despair, the illusion shattered, revealing Moros retreating into the shadows, disappointed by his failure. Despite all the obstacles and trials, Rhea did not lose hope. Each step forward, each danger overcome, brought her closer to her final destination, finding the magical artifact that could save the forest. The trials were not only tests of her strength and courage, but also of her wisdom and compassion. Each encounter, whether with friends or foes, was a lesson, an essential part of her journey of self-discovery. Thus, 
Rhea continued to move forward, guided by the gentle light of Lycos and her own determination. With each challenge overcome, she felt herself growing stronger and more prepared for what lay ahead. Her trials were not just obstacles, but also opportunities to learn, to grow, and to become the true protector of the Silver Forest. Finally, after traversing numerous obstacles and trials, Rhea reached her destination, a grotto bathed in a silver light, so bright it seemed unreal. The grotto lay deep within the heart of the Silver Forest, a sacred and protected place hidden from the eyes of the uninitiated. It was a natural sanctuary where the magic of the forest pulsed with the greatest intensity, and time seemed to stand still. Here, in this peaceful and sacred refuge, Rhea felt an ancient and wise presence that filled her with a sense of peace and reverence. In the middle of the grotto, on an ancient stone pedestal, rested the magical heart of the forest, an artifact of unparalleled beauty. It was a crystallized stone of exceptional clarity, emitting a silver light that seemed to dance on the walls of the grotto. Rhea approached with a mix of fear and awe, knowing that this was the object she had sought, the key to saving the forest and restoring natural balance. Before she could touch the artifact, an ethereal figure appeared before her, the spirit of the forest. The spirit, an ancient and wise entity, had an imposing yet gentle presence. With luminous eyes and a serene face, it spoke with a voice like a gentle breeze, asking Rhea about her motives. The spirit wanted to ensure that her desire to save the forest was pure, without personal ambition or a desire for power. It explained that Rhea must pass three trials to prove the purity of her heart and her true desire to protect the forest. The first trial was the trial of courage. The spirit created an illusion in which Rhea found herself on the edge of a deep chasm, with strong winds pushing her toward the edge. On the other side of the chasm, she saw a small, helpless child crying in fear. Rhea felt immense fear but knew she had to save the child. Without hesitation, she used all her inner strength to cross the chasm, facing the winds and the fear of the unknown. When she reached the child, the illusion dissipated, and the spirit confirmed that she had successfully passed the first trial, demonstrating her courage. The second trial was the trial of wisdom. Rhea was placed in a magical landscape where all the plants and animals seemed to be in perfect harmony. There, the spirit showed her an old, sick tree on the verge of collapse, which supported the life of other plants and animals. Rhea had to find a solution to save the tree without disturbing the ecosystem around it. She recalled the knowledge passed down from her grandmother and the forest spirits, using it to prepare a healing potion from magical herbs. Carefully, she applied the potion to the tree's roots, which began to regain their vigor. The spirit smiled, recognizing Rhea's wisdom and knowledge in maintaining nature's balance. The final trial was the trial of the soul. The spirit of the forest presented Rhea with a vision in which a black dragon, a symbol of greed and destruction, 
devastated the last oases of greenery in a land depleted of magic. To prove the purity of her heart, Rhea had to find a way to stop the dragon without resorting to violence. Instead of attacking, Rhea approached the dragon with compassion, speaking to it about the power of transformation and offering it the chance to become a protector of the forest. She healed an old wound, demonstrating kindness and generosity. Moved by her gesture, the dragon chose to change its ways. This choice showed the spirit of the forest that Rhea understood the true power of compassion and empathy. With the trials completed, the spirit of the forest granted Rhea its blessing. Rhea reached out and touched the magical heart, feeling a powerful and warm energy envelop her entire body. The magical heart gave her an even deeper connection to the forest, a greater understanding of nature's delicate balance and her role as its protector. But before she could use this power to restore balance to the forest, Moros appeared, furious and full of hatred. The dark sorcerer was ready to destroy everything to achieve his malevolent goals. He tried to stop Rhea, casting dark spells and unleashing the forces of darkness. But Rhea was not alone. Lycos, the Silver Guardian, appeared by her side, ready to defend and fight for the forest. In an intense confrontation, full of magic and light, Rhea and Lycos combined their forces. With the help of the magical heart, they unleashed a burst of purifying light, an energy that pierced the darkness and enveloped the entire forest. This light not only drove away the forces of darkness, but also restored balance and harmony to the forest. Moros, unable to withstand this pure power, was imprisoned in a magical underground prison, a place hidden deep beneath the roots of the oldest trees in the forest, where he could no longer do harm. The world of the forest was thus freed from his malevolent influence, and the creatures and spirits of the forest could once again breathe in peace and safety. With the forest saved, Rhea felt a great peace in her soul. At that moment, she knew her mission was not just a simple duty, but a deeper calling to protect and respect nature. She became the new guardian of the forest, alongside Lycos, taking on the role of watching over this magical world and ensuring that harmony and balance would always be preserved. This story, though seemingly about a single girl and her guardian wolf, became a legend reminding everyone of the importance of protecting nature and the responsibility we have to live in harmony with all beings. The magical world and the human world, though distinct, were more united than ever through the sacred bond Rhea represented. She learned and demonstrated that true power does not lie in strength or magic, but in courage, love, and respect for all living things. And so, dear listeners, we come to the end of our adventure in the magical world of the Silver Wolf. This story reminds us how important it is to love and protect nature, for within it lie our roots and the power to live in harmony. So, remember that in every dream lies a fascinating story, and in every corner of nature a drop of magic awaits to be discovered. If this journey has brought you joy and warmed your heart, don't forget to like, subscribe, 
and click the notification bell so you never miss a new magical story. What would you do if you could communicate with animals and forests like Rhea? Would you use this power to protect nature's balance or explore the hidden secrets of the world? Share your thoughts and dreams in the comments. Until next time, I wish you sweet dreams and to live each day with open hearts to the wonders of nature. Dear listeners, tonight I invite you to step into an enchanted world where courage and forgiveness unveil hidden mysteries and unmatched adventures. Sit comfortably, close your eyes, and let the story take you to a magical kingdom where darkness is dispelled by the light of truth and noble sacrifices bring freedom and peace. The Royal Plot In times long past, when emperors ruled with an iron fist over shining kingdoms and thieves moved like shadows in the night, there lived a young woman of rare skill named Lyra, raised in the dark alleys of a large city where poverty and need reigned supreme. Lyra had made a name for herself as the most skillful thief in the kingdom. But fate had bigger plans for her, plans that would take her far from the streets she knew, into the heart of a plot that threatened to change the fate of the kingdom forever. On a clear night, under the starry sky, Lyra carefully pulled her hood over her head, hiding her delicate features. Her ebony black hair and hazel eyes blended into the night's shadows. She was known for her remarkable abilities and her knack for disappearing without a trace. Raised in the harsh alleys, she had learned to steal from a young age, adapting to a life full of dangers. Now, however, she faced the greatest challenge of her life infiltrating the royal palace. The plan was simple, but dangerous. Dressed in the humble clothes of a maid, Lyra was to sneak into the palace, blend in with the servants, and at the right moment, steal the queen's jewels, objects of immense value. She had to leave no trace, no suspicion. Her crew was counting on her, and failure was not an option. Swallowing her conflicting emotions, Lyra assumed the role of a maid. That night, as she passed through the palace's massive gate, she felt her heart tighten. The palace, an imposing structure of white stone, gleamed under the lantern lights, and the air was filled with floral scents. Every step she took brought her closer to the queen's jewels and a tremendous danger. As soon as she entered, she blended in with the other maids, trying not to draw attention. She observed how each person knew their place and responsibilities well. Wasting no time, Lyra began to learn the court's routine. She closely observed how the servants moved through the palace's vast rooms, how they carried trays with grace, and how they responded respectfully to every command. With each passing day, Lyra adapted more and more to court life. Every gesture, every movement, was studied and reproduced exactly, ensuring that no one could distinguish her from the other servants. Quickly learning the daily habits and rituals, she found herself fascinated by the world she was discovering. The palace was a place of contradictions. The splendor and luxury on the surface hid tensions and secrets. 
and although the people seemed to live in harmony, they had their own agendas and hidden motives. The biggest surprise for Lyra was the queen herself. Although she initially had no opinion about the monarch, observing her from a distance, Lyra began to feel a slight admiration for her. The queen was not just a decorative figure, but a person respected and loved by everyone around her. The servants spoke respectfully about her generosity and kindness, and the people saw her as a just leader. These details, which Lyra gathered like pieces of a puzzle, began to paint a complex and fascinating picture of the queen. As the days passed, Lyra couldn't help but be impressed by how the queen interacted with people. She saw them bow before her, not out of fear, but out of genuine respect. The queen, in turn, responded with a warm smile, and her gaze was full of understanding and compassion. These small, sincere gestures began to plant the seeds of doubt in Lyra's heart. It was a new and unexpected feeling for her to admire someone she was supposed to see only as a target. Every time she passed by the queen's chamber on her way to the servants' quarters, Lyra felt a pang of guilt. The thought of stealing from someone so respected and kind unsettled her. But she remembered her responsibility to her crew, to the people who raised and shaped her, and the promise she had made. She repeated to herself that this was just another mission, and that she had to stay focused. Nevertheless, in a corner of her heart, she began to question whether her mission was truly just. The admiration she felt for the queen, though faint, grew with each passing day. She wanted to understand more about this strong woman, how she managed to lead her people and earn the respect of those around her. The questions began to accumulate, and the mission seemed increasingly complicated. Lyra didn't know it then, but this small admiration she felt for the queen would play a crucial role in the decisions she would make. In a world full of shadows and secrets, the young thief was beginning to discover not only the palace's secrets, but also her own conscience. Though not yet sure why she felt something in her was changing, perhaps the queen's understanding and compassion were beginning to influence her. Or maybe she was starting to find her own code of honor. But one thing was clear. The mission in the royal palace would not only be about the queen's jewels, but also about discovering the truth and her own identity. On a quiet night, when the full moon cast its silver light over the royal palace, Lyra moved gracefully through the dark corridors, performing her usual exploration routine. She knew her route by heart, each step calculated, each shadow expertly used for concealment. Although she diligently fulfilled her role as a maid, her thief's instincts urged her to explore every corner of the palace, to know every secret door every hidden window. This desire for knowledge, combined with the need to find the safest path to the queen's jewels, had taken her through these silent corridors countless times. That night, however, something unexpected happened. As she approached a partially open door, she heard whispered but intense voices coming from inside the room. Lyra pressed herself against the wall, 
trying to become one with the shadow. It was a skill she had mastered perfectly, trained over the years to become invisible when needed. Holding her breath, she leaned closer to hear better. Inside, two high-ranking nobles were having a heated discussion. They talked about an elaborate plan to assassinate the queen, a conspiracy that seemed to involve several influential figures at court. Their voices were full of contempt and determination, and their words painted a clear picture of their dark intentions. Lyra felt her heart pound. It was no longer just a rumor or suspected betrayal, but a real plot, one that could change the kingdom's course. For a moment, she felt a wave of panic and confusion. What was she supposed to do? Her thief's instinct told her to run, to continue her mission, and forget everything she had heard. But another voice, deeper and harder to ignore, whispered that she had to do something. She couldn't remain indifferent to such a threat. Lyra found herself caught between two worlds, one of loyalty to her crew, and another of a burgeoning sense of justice in her heart. Her loyalty to her crew was deep and personal. These were the people who had raised her, who had given her purpose in a cruel and unforgiving world. Although the life of a thief was full of risks, it was the only one she had ever known. But now, uncovering the plot, she began to doubt the morality of her actions. It was becoming increasingly clear that she couldn't carry out her mission without doing something about the plot. Lyra remembered the queen she had silently admired. A strong woman, loved and respected by the people and those at court. The thought that someone might harm her to seize power filled her with indignation. That night, hiding in the shadows, Lyra felt the weight of truth and responsibility for the first time. As the voices in the room continued to discuss the details of their plan, Lyra realized the gravity of the situation. Any mistake on her part could cost the queen's life and the kingdom's stability. This realization overwhelmed her but also motivated her. Deep down, she knew she couldn't ignore what she had learned. But what could she do? She was just a simple maid, a disguised thief. She wasn't even sure she would be believed if she told the truth. Emerging from the shadows, she remembered all the skills she had, all the tricks she had learned. She needed a plan, one that would expose the plot without raising suspicion about herself. She knew she had to stay calm and act carefully. It was a delicate task, but Lyra was determined to see it through. As she made her way back to the servants' quarters, Lyra felt that something inside her had changed. In a world full of shadows and secrets, she had discovered that she had the power to make a difference. That night, within the palace's silent walls, Lyra became not just a witness to the plot, but a woman who had to choose between her past and a new path. One full of uncertainties, but also promises. And for the first time, Lyra began to wonder if her true loyalty shouldn't be to something greater than herself. Time was running out mercilessly, and each tick of the clock increased the pressure on Lyra. Aware of the gravity of the situation and the impending confrontation, she felt adrenaline coursing through her veins. 
In a final effort to save the queen and stop the plot, Lyra devised a bold and risky plan based on the limited resources available. Every step was crucial and had to be executed with precision. The first step of the plan was to gather incriminating evidence. Lyra began sneaking into the offices and rooms of the suspected nobles, searching for documents, letters, or any other proof that would confirm their sinister intentions. During one of these nighttime incursions, she was nearly caught by one of the conspirators, but quickly hid in a dark niche, waiting for the danger to pass. She breathed a sigh of relief, only when the footsteps faded away. But this incident made her realize how dangerous the situation was. On another occasion, she discovered a secret room filled with maps and plans, a place apparently used for plotting the attack. She quickly made copies of the documents using a technique she had learned from her mentors. In another night, Lyra discovered a coded letter detailing the assassination plan, which was to take place during the royal ball. The letter was the key she needed, but it had to be deciphered quickly. With the help of an ally among the servants, a smart young man with a passion for cryptography, they managed to decrypt the message. It confirmed the plot and specified the exact time and place of the attack. Realizing she couldn't act alone, Lyra began to seek allies. She remembered a few servants and guards she had observed over time, people loyal to the queen and whom she could trust. With a pounding heart, Lyra approached these people in confidence, revealing the truth about the plot. She knew the risk was enormous. A single mistake or betrayal could destroy everything. One evening, while talking with one of the guards, she noticed a shadow moving on the wall. Lyra and the guard quickly retreated into a side room, hiding until the danger passed. Despite these close calls, many of those she approached were willing to listen and ultimately help her. The plan began to take shape. Lyra's allies devised a detailed plan to thwart the plot. The loyal guards were to be strategically positioned in the throne room and adjacent corridors to observe any suspicious movements and intervene quickly if necessary. The faithful servants were to monitor the activities of the involved nobles, ensuring they had no opportunity to act. During these preparations, Lyra and her allies had to avoid unexpected traps. One evening, while trying to deliver a crucial message to one of the loyal guards, she was intercepted by a suspicious noble. With calculated calm, Lyra pretended she was lost and looking for the exit, managing to fool him and escape unharmed. On another occasion, a group of loyal servants was almost exposed when one of the conspirators started asking uncomfortable questions about their presence in certain parts of the palace. With quick thinking, they convinced him they were there for ball preparations, thus avoiding dangerous exposure. In another attempt to test the loyalty of the servants, the conspirators organized an unexpected inspection of the palace kitchen where Lyra and her allies planned to meet. Anticipating such a move, Lyra had hidden the incriminating documents in a safe place. Additionally, she orchestrated a brief interruption of the light, caused by a draft that suddenly extinguished the candles illuminating the corridor and kitchen. 
In the ensuing darkness, the servants managed to disperse without drawing attention, and the inspectors found nothing compromising. With all these preparations underway, Lyra and her allies worked tirelessly, perfecting every detail of the plan. They established coded signals for quick and efficient communication in emergencies and rehearsed various scenarios, ensuring that every participant knew exactly what to do in any situation. The tension was palpable, but their determination to protect the queen and thwart the plot was equally strong. On the day of the ball, the palace was abuzz with excitement and frantic preparations. Lyra and her allies took their strategic positions, each playing their part meticulously. Lyra, disguised in an elegant gown, mingled with the guests, watching every detail closely. The loyal guards were at their posts, and the servants patrolled discreetly, ready to act at the slightest sign of danger. The night of the grand royal ball had arrived, and the conspiracy against the queen was about to be executed. Lyra, along with her allies, was prepared for the most dangerous night of their lives. With the gathered evidence and a well-laid plan, they had a chance to thwart the plot and save the kingdom. Hidden in the shadows of massive columns, Lyra held her breath. Every moment seemed to stretch into eternity, and her heartbeat matched the slow ticking of a nearby clock. She felt her muscles tense, ready to act at the first sign of danger. Beside her, a few of the loyal guards she had enlisted stood in position, prepared to intervene. Each of them knew what to do. The signals were set, and everyone was on high alert. When the massive doors of the throne room opened, Lyra felt the tension reach a new peak. The conspirators, dressed in gala attire, but carrying dark intentions in their hearts, stepped inside, their faces masked with respectability. The queen, unaware of the truth that was about to be revealed, welcomed them with her characteristic smile, suspecting nothing of the lurking danger. As the ball progressed, Lyra kept her eyes fixed on the conspirators. At one point, one of them approached the queen, offering her a glass of wine. Lyra recognized the vial of poison she had seen during a previous incursion. With a quick and discreet gesture, she signaled the guards. In a moment of terrifying silence, Lyra gave the signal. The loyal guards quickly intervened, surrounding the traitors before they could act. A brief but intense fight ensued in the throne room. Lyra, armed with a small sword hidden in her dress, joined the fray. The confrontation was chaotic. The sound of metal clashing against metal, the shouts, and the noise of the frightened crowd blended into a dizzying cacophony. Lyra moved with agility and grace, dodging attacks and striking back with astonishing precision. At one point, one of the conspirators managed to break free from the circle of guards and rushed toward the queen, but Lyra intervened swiftly, preventing him from reaching his target. With a bold move, she disarmed and immobilized him. In the chaos, each of Lyra's allies acted according to the plan, ensuring no traitor escaped unscathed. When finally silence returned, traitors were captured, bound, and helpless. The queen, shocked 
and still puzzled by what had happened, looked around at the familiar faces of people she had trusted. With calm determination, Ra approached the throne, kneeling before the queen, and revealing the plot that had been woven right under her nose. She showed documents and incriminating letters, explaining the assassination plan in detail. In those moments of loaded silence, the queen listened carefully to Lyra's revelations. The truth was hard to accept, but the evidence presented was undeniable. With tears in her eyes, the queen expressed her gratitude to Lyra and her allies, realizing that her life and the kingdom's stability had been saved by these brave servants. She thanked Lyra for her courage and for the difficult choice of revealing the truth, even at the risk of betraying her own crew. After the traitors were escorted out and calm was restored, the queen turned to Lyra, still kneeling. In a gentle voice, the queen offered her pardon for any past transgressions. Moreover, seeing Lyra's potential and courage, she offered her a new life, away from crime and the lawlessness of her past. The queen offered her a unique position as a secret agent of the crown, a chance to use her skills not for theft, but for the kingdom's protection. Lyra with tears in her eyes and a heart full of gratitude, accepted the queen's offer. She felt it finally found her place in the world, a vocation that allowed her to use her talents for a noble cause. She realized that she was not only changing her life, but also becoming part of something greater than herself, a protector of peace and justice in the kingdom. On the palace terrace, under the dark sky, Lyra watched the sunset. In that blessed silence, Lyra felt that she had found her true calling. Looking at the starry sky, she vowed to dedicate her life to protecting the queen and the kingdom, to be a force for good in a world often dark and full of uncertainties. Through her courage, Lyra demonstrated that anyone, regardless of their past, can choose to be a force for good. Faced with trials and moral dilemmas, she found the strength to do what is right, becoming a beacon of hope and justice for all those around her. And so, her story inspires us to find our own inner light and let it shine, even in the darkest times. And so, dear listeners, we have reached the end of this captivating journey with Lyra, a brave young woman who found her calling. Remember that in every darkness lies a fascinating story, and every shadow can hide a magic waiting to be discovered. If you enjoyed this adventure full of courage and mystery, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you won't miss any other magical stories. The question is, what would you do if you had the chance to become a defender of the kingdom, like Lyra? Would you embrace courage to protect what is right and noble? Or would you stay in the shadows, avoiding dangers? Share your thoughts in the comments. Until next time, have pleasant dreams and magical adventures every night. Dear listeners, on this magical night, I invite you to step into a world full of mystery and bravery. In the enchanted kingdom of Eldoria, tales of adventure come to life and heroes rise from the shadows of betrayal. 
close your eyes and let the story take you on an incredible journey where every step brings us closer to the truth. The Phantom Bow Royal Secrets and Dark Intrigue In the long-forgotten era of the Kingdom of Eldoria, where kings ruled with an iron fist and knights were revered as legendary heroes, peace and prosperity seemed unshakable under King Alaric's rule. Eldoria was a place of tranquility and abundance, where people lived in harmony, enjoying the blessings of wise and fair leadership. King Alaric was seen as a just monarch, bringing stability and order to a world often filled with chaos. However, this serenity was abruptly shaken by rumors of a mysterious band of thieves known as the Phantom Bow. These thieves began to make their presence felt through swift and unexpected attacks, targeting royal caravans and isolated castles. People spoke of these bandits with fear and awe, telling tales of how they emerged from the shadows and acted with almost supernatural precision. Each heist was marked by a silver arrow, left as the band's signature. The silver arrow, glinting coldly in the moonlight, had become the symbol of a new era of insecurity and fear in Eldoria. The Phantom Bow Band was no ordinary group of thieves. They operated with remarkable precision, carefully selecting their victims. They focused on nobles known for their greed and corruption, often attacking them in the most remote corners of the kingdom where they felt safest. This selective approach made the band seem more than just simple thieves. They appeared to be the hand of a shadowy avenger, choosing their victims not only for their wealth, but also for their misdeeds. On a moonless night, when darkness seemed to swallow the world whole, a royal caravan carrying jewels and important documents traversed an isolated road. This caravan was well guarded, but the Phantom Bow Band had other plans. Dressed in black and moving with the agility of shadows, the thieves intercepted the caravan. They slipped through the soldiers with a dexterity and precision that took everyone by surprise. In moments, the guards were neutralized and the thieves vanished taking the entire hall with them. The only sign of their presence was a silver arrow, deliberately left as an enigmatic mark, gleaming faintly in the torchlight. This attack, like the ones before it, cast a shadow of concern over the kingdom of Eldoria. People began to speak of the phantom bow as if they were ghosts, Entities that appeared and disappeared without a trace, leaving behind only a sense of fear and unease. The royal court was on high alert, trying to discover who these thieves were and how they managed to operate with such precision and detailed knowledge of royal movements. Rumors about the thieves and their daring or dangerous deeds spread quickly throughout the kingdom. In village taverns and noble salons, people debated the motives and identity of these bandits. Some saw them as heroes, avenging the injustices committed by corrupt nobles, while others viewed them as dangerous criminals who needed to be captured as soon as possible. Regardless of opinions, everyone agreed that the Phantom Bow was a real threat to the peace and stability 
of the kingdom. These events put pressure on King Alaric and his advisors. They needed to find a way to stop these attacks and restore order to the kingdom. Meanwhile, Anwen, the princess of the kingdom, became increasingly interested in this mysterious band. She could not understand how the thieves managed to evade capture every time and why they targeted specific individuals. It was clear that these people had a well-thought-out strategy and that someone inside the royal court was informing them. Despite increased security measures and intense investigations, the Phantom Bow continued to operate consistently. Each new heist brought more questions and fewer answers. People placed their hopes in Princess Anwen, known for her courage and intelligence, hoping she would uncover the truth behind these attacks. Meanwhile, the Silver Arrow remained a symbol of an unresolved mystery, a constant reminder of the shadows lurking in the dark corners of the kingdom of Eldoria. Thus, in this troubled time, the kingdom of Eldoria found itself at a crossroads. The peace and prosperity of old were now threatened by an invisible enemy, and the truth about the phantom bow seemed harder to discover. King Alaric and the royal court knew they had to act quickly and decisively to restore order and protect the kingdom from the looming dangers. But to do so, they first had to understand the true motives and identity of those hiding under the shadows of the phantom bow. Anwen, the brave princess of the kingdom of Eldoria, and Kirin, her trusted friend and a skilled military strategist, felt that the silence surrounding the attacks of the phantom bow band could no longer be ignored. With each report of looted caravans and raided isolated castles, the threat became more real, and the kingdom, once peaceful and prosperous, was now under a shadow of uncertainty. The thieves acted with boldness and efficiency, suggesting a well-organized entity, and Anwen and Kieran decided that action was necessary. Determined to uncover the truth behind these attacks, the two chose a small trusted guard and set off on a perilous journey through Eldoria. Their first stop was a small, quiet village where the locals, initially hesitant, began to talk about the appearance of mysterious strangers before each heist. These strangers, described as silent and observant, seemed to study the area meticulously. Anwen and Kieran quickly realized that these observers were more than mere background figures. They were likely the eyes and ears of the band, ensuring that each attack was precisely planned. As they progressed, they gathered more and more testimonies confirming this hypothesis. In every location, people spoke of the same silent and mysterious figures who seemed to appear from nowhere and disappear without a trace. The descriptions varied, but one detail remained constant. These strangers had an intense gaze, as if they were absorbing every detail of their surroundings. Anwen realized that these observations were not random, and that the band had a well-defined plan. One day, during a stop in a secluded village, Anwen and Kieran met a wise old man with hair as white as snow and piercing eyes. The old man told them he knew why they were there and spoke of the Silver Raven, an old tavern hidden deep in the forest. 
This place, he explained, was a refuge for those who wanted to hide from prying eyes. The Silver Raven sheltered adventurers and people with less noble intentions, making it a perfect spot for those lurking in the shadows, like the members of the Phantom Bow Band. The old man's story captivated their attention. Anwen and Kieran realized that this tavern could be the key to uncovering the band's identity and finding out who the shadowy leaders were. Determined to go to the end, they decided to head for the Silver Raven. The journey was not without difficulties. The forests of Eldoria were dense and mysterious, covered by a thick canopy of leaves that let in very little light. The rough terrain and winding paths made their journey challenging, and dangers soon emerged. One night, as they traveled through a particularly dark part of the forest, they were caught off guard by a sudden storm. The wind howled fiercely, and the torrential rain hindered their progress. Their guards, though well-trained, struggled to keep the group united and safe. The storm brought out other dangers, too. Fallen trees and venomous snakes that emerged from their hiding spots. Despite these obstacles, Anwen and Kieran remained steadfast, using their knowledge and skills to navigate through this trial. Along the way, they encountered more signs of the band. One day, they came across a site of a recent attack. The caravan had been looted, and the guards killed. Anwen felt a cold shiver when she saw the silver arrow left behind, the unmistakable mark of the band. This was a clear sign that they were on the right track, but also a reminder of the danger that loomed. In another village, a young monk told them about a group of men seen near the local monastery, asking about the caravan that was supposed to pass through the area. The monk described them as individuals who seemed to know too much about the royal movements, making Anwen and Kieran believe that the band had informants in high places. This information strengthened their suspicions of a betrayal within the royal court. Despite the encountered dangers and the hardships faced, Anwen and Kieran continued to advance, guided by their determination to bring light to the darkness threatening Eldoria. Every night, under the starry sky, or sheltered in wooden cabins, they discussed strategies and solidified their plans. Each clue and story heard brought them closer to the truth and strengthened their resolve not to stop until they had discovered everything. After many days of arduous travel, crossing fast rivers and climbing steep slopes, they finally sighted the Silver Raven. The tavern rose before them, surrounded by tall, shady trees, and the atmosphere around it was dense and mysterious. This was no ordinary building. It seemed to pulse with untold secrets and housed long-forgotten stories. Anwen and Kieran realized they had reached their destination, but also that the real challenge was just beginning. They had to discover if the Silver Raven was truly the key to unlocking the mystery of the Phantom Bow Band and saving the kingdom of Eldoria from the lurking dangers. With determination and courage, they stepped towards the tavern, ready to face whatever secrets this enigmatic place held. The Silver Raven Tavern was an old, dark building shrouded in mystery and legends. 
located deep in the forests of Eldoria. It was known only to a few, frequented by adventurous travelers and those with less noble intentions. The atmosphere was charged, and the air seemed to vibrate with the hidden secrets of those seeking refuge within its walls. Anwen and Kieran, determined to uncover the truth behind the phantom bow band, infiltrated the tavern, posing as weary travelers. That evening, the tavern was filled with people, each engrossed in their own business. The dim light from oil lamps cast long shadows on the walls, and thick tobacco smoke filled the air. Anwen and Kieran sat at a secluded table, observing everything around them with keen interest. They soon noticed a group of men whispering at a table in a dark corner. On the wall behind them, a silver arrow was used as a decoration, immediately catching their attention. This was the unmistakable symbol of the phantom bow band, a sign that these men were more than just ordinary travelers. Without drawing attention to themselves, Anwen and Kieran carefully listened to the conversation. From the snippets they could hear, it was clear that these men were involved in illicit activities, discussing heists and how to evade the kingdom's guards. When the group left the tavern, Anwen and Kieran discreetly followed them, guided by their instincts and desire to learn more. The trail led them through a dense forest, where tall, dark trees seemed to close in above them hiding any trace of light. After a while, they reached an isolated cabin, hidden among the trees and enveloped in shadows. The pale candlelight shone through the dirty windows, suggesting the place was inhabited. Anwen and Kieran approached cautiously, hiding in the shadows, ready to uncover the truth. Inside the cabin, Low voices and tense conversations were clearly audible. It was evident that the place was a hub of activity for the band. From the conversations they overheard, Anwen and Kieran learned details about the band's plans and a larger plot aimed at destabilizing the kingdom. However, the most shocking moment came when the band leader revealed his true identity. With her heart pounding, Anwen recognized the face of her half-brother, Kaelin, whom everyone believed had died in a tragic accident. This moment was a true blow for her. Conflicting emotions, shock, sadness, anger, and a strong desire to understand overwhelmed her. Kaelin, noticing their presence, remained calm and began to explain everything. With a determined look and a grave voice, Kaelin recounted how he survived the accident that was supposed to be fatal. It was a sunny day when the royal caravan he was traveling in was attacked in an unexpected and violent manner. The attack was well organized and Kaelin, gravely injured, was left to die. However, despite his wounds, he managed to crawl to a nearby stream, where he was found and cared for by a hermit living in the forest. Kaelin gradually recovered, and, hidden from the world, began to investigate the circumstances of the attack. He discovered that the attack was not a mere incident, but a deliberate assassination attempt orchestrated by a group of treacherous nobles who wanted him out of the way to continue their plans unimpeded. These traitors, using their positions of power and influence, planned to hand Eldoria over to an external enemy. Their goal was to destabilize the kingdom from within, 
preparing the ground for an invasion that would bring an end to Eldoria's independence. To gather evidence against them, Kalin infiltrated the ranks of these conspirators, using his false identity and the Phantom Bow Band, which he formed from trusted individuals. The band's heists were a means to draw attention to these traitors, forcing the kingdom to act and expose the threat. Kalin presented Anwen and Kieran with secret documents, letters, and maps, proving the involvement of key court members in the plot. Each document was a piece of a dark puzzle, showing how these nobles conspired to destabilize the kingdom. Kalin hoped that through these actions, he could save Eldoria from destruction and reveal the hidden truth. Anwen and Kieran, though still shocked by the leader's identity, were convinced of Kalin's sincerity. The documents presented were too convincing to ignore. Realizing the gravity of the situation, they decided to act together with Kalin to expose the traitors and protect the kingdom. Their decision was not easy, but it was clear that Eldoria faced a major threat and that the truth had to come to light, no matter the cost. Together, Anwen, Kieran, and Kalin began to plan their next steps. They knew they needed to gather more evidence and expose the plot before the traitors could carry out their plans. It was a dangerous mission, but with each other's support and the evidence they had, they hoped to expose the truth and save the kingdom of Eldoria. In that moment, the Silver Raven Tavern and the isolated cabin in the forest had become scenes of a discovery that could change the course of Eldoria's history. The hidden truths, kept secret for so long, were about to be revealed. Anwen, Kieran, and Kaelin were determined to fight for justice and the future of their kingdom, knowing that the upcoming battle would not be easy, but it was worth fighting to the end. Anwen and Kaelin strode into the throne room in the solemn calm of the royal palace. The court was abuzz with anticipation for their return and word of the emergency meeting they had called. Encircled by his trusty advisors, King Alaric sat imposingly on his throne, renowned for his knowledge and fairness. Everyone in the room was conscious of the importance of the event that was about to happen, so there was a palpable sense of tension and expectation in the air. Anwen, with a clear and firm voice, began to present the evidence gathered against the treacherous nobles. In her hands, she held detailed documents, contact lists, and secret correspondence that clearly showed the involvement of these individuals in the plot to hand the kingdom of Eldoria over to an external enemy. The silver arrow, the symbol of the band that had spread fear and uncertainty, was now used as evidence of the accusations brought forth. Each document presented was a piece of a dark puzzle exposing the malevolent plans and betrayal of those supposed to be loyal to the crown. As Anwen spoke, the eyes of those present shifted between her and the accused nobility. The reactions of the accused varied from anger to despair, as each accusation was formulated with precision and supported by undeniable proof. Some of the nobles, vehemently denied the accusations, standing up and shouting that it was all a setup. However, 
The evidence presented by Anwen and Kalin was too clear and detailed to be contested. In the face of the relentless truth, their attempts at defense proved futile. While the accusations were laid out, Anwen reminded everyone how, during all this time, Kalin had gathered evidence and recruited loyal people to form the Phantom Bow Band, using the heists to draw attention to the corruption within the royal court. King Alaric, visibly affected by the revelations, listened attentively to every detail. He, who had ruled the kingdom with honor and fairness, felt betrayed by those he considered trusted allies. Deeply wounded by these betrayals, he looked gravely at the assembled nobility. After a brief pause, the king found his words and spoke with calm but firm authority. He acknowledged that although some of those involved had been manipulated or coerced, this could not excuse their actions. He decided to offer clemency to those who had been manipulated, giving them a chance to redeem themselves. However, for the main instigators who orchestrated and led the plot, he promised they would be punished according to the kingdom's law. The king was particularly affected to see that among the traitors were individuals he had considered close and loyal. However, despite this pain, Alaric was immensely relieved to see his son, Kalin, alive and well. The king had a moment of great emotion, embracing his son, grateful for his courage and determination. Kalin, in turn, apologized for not being able to reveal the truth earlier, and for the fear and confusion caused by his disappearance. His revelations, though painful, were essential for saving the kingdom. The king acknowledged that, although Kalin and the Phantom Bow Band's methods were unorthodox, their intentions to protect Eldoria and expose the traitors were commendable. Kalin, with rare humility, apologized for the fear and confusion caused, promising to serve the kingdom with loyalty and devotion from now on. Anwen was honored as the kingdom's heroine and acknowledged for her bravery and unwavering commitment to pursuing justice and the truth. She proved that the truth must always win out in spite of obstacles and risks. After this fight, Kalin reorganized the Phantom Bow Band as a force for justice rather than as a gang of rebels. This new group promised to defend the kingdom of Eldoria from any threats in the future, and it did so with a clear and noble goal. The Silver Arrow has evolved from being a representation of dread and uncertainty to one of bravery and justice. The kingdom ushered in a new era of prosperity and peace with this symbol one in which each and every person could feel respected and protected. And so, dear listeners, we reach the end of our adventure in the kingdom of Eldoria, alongside our heroes, Anwen and Kaelin. Their story has shown us that truth and courage can illuminate even the darkest corners of the kingdom, and forgiveness can bring peace to the hearts of the lost. If you enjoyed this journey full of mystery and magic, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you won't miss our future stories. What would you do if you discovered a dark secret like the Phantom Bow? Share your thoughts with us in the comments. Until next time, 
have sweet dreams and magical adventures every night. Dear listeners, tonight I will take you on a journey to a tranquil village nestled among emerald hills, where an ancient Celtic legend of bravery and magic comes to life. The tale of Grogosh, the invisible guardian. Settle in comfortably, close your eyes, and let yourselves be enveloped by this enchanting story. Grogok, the Invisible Guardian Ancient Celtic Legend In the heart of a lush valley, cradled by rolling hills and emerald forests, lay the serene village of Ballycraig. The village, with its quaint cottages and cobblestone paths, had long been a place of peace and prosperity. The fields surrounding Ballycraig were once a tapestry of vibrant greens and golds, where crops grew in abundance and livestock roamed freely. The gentle hum of daily life was accompanied by the cheerful songs of birds and the soft rustling of leaves in the breeze. The villagers, known for their hard work and close-knit community, thrived on the land's bounty, living harmoniously with nature. But a shadow had crept over Ballycraig, casting a pall of fear and uncertainty. It began subtly, almost imperceptibly. The first sign was the failing crops. Stalks that once stood tall and proud now wilted and turned brown. Fields that had yielded bountiful harvests now lay barren and lifeless. The villagers tried to revive their plants, pouring their hearts into the soil, but their efforts were in vain. The land, it seemed, had turned against them. Soon after, the livestock began to disappear. Sheep, cows, and chickens vanished without a trace, leaving behind only empty pens and anxious owners. The village's source of sustenance was dwindling, and with it, the hope that had always been a hallmark of Ballycraig. The vibrant life that once filled the village square with laughter and chatter was replaced by hushed whispers and worried glances. Fear spread like a contagion, gripping the hearts of the villagers. The cause of these misfortunes was a subject of much speculation. Some believed it to be the work of a vengeful spirit. Others thought it a punishment from the gods. But as the days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months, a single name began to surface more frequently in the conversations of the worried villagers. Fomorian. According to ancient legends, Fomorian was a malevolent force that dwelled deep within the earth. It was said to awaken in times of strife, bringing calamity and despair to those it encountered. The tale spoke of its immense power and its ability to blight the land, destroy crops, and steal livestock. The very mention of Fomorian sent shivers down the spines of those who uttered its name. Desperation began to set in. The villagers, once a beacon of resilience, found themselves at a loss. The village elders, who had seen many seasons come and go, could not recall a time of such hardship. The youngest children, sensing the unease of their parents, clung to them tightly, their innocent eyes wide with fear. The village needed a solution, and it needed one quickly. One crisp evening, under a sky streaked with the colors of dusk, 
the community gathered in the village square. The square, usually a place of lively markets and joyous celebrations, was now filled with somber faces. Torches flickered in the twilight, casting long shadows on the cobblestones. The villagers stood in a circle, their heads bowed, their voices low. They shared their worries, their fears, and their hopes for a brighter tomorrow. In the midst of the gathering, an old man stepped forward. His name was Kion, and he was known far and wide for his wisdom and knowledge of the old ways. His hair was as white as the first snowfall of winter, and his eyes, though dimmed by age, still held a spark of ancient fire. He raised his hands, and the murmurs of the crowd ceased. Listen well, my friends, Kian began, his voice steady and strong. The troubles we face are not of this world alone. They stem from forces beyond our understanding, from a darkness that has awakened from its slumber. Fomorian, the blight upon our land, is the source of our woes. A collective gasp rose from the villagers. They had feared as much, but to hear it confirmed by the wise Xi'an sent a chill through the crowd. But all is not lost, Xi'an continued his voice lifting with a note of hope. Long ago, before even I was born, there were beings who walked among us, unseen but ever-present. The Grogok, they were called. Guardians of the natural world, protectors of the balance of life. It is said that they possess the power to heal the land and banish the darkness. If we can find a Grogok, we may yet save Bally Craig. Hope flickered in the hearts of the villagers, like the torches that surrounded them. The tales of the Grogok were ancient, passed down through generations, and many had dismissed them as mere legend. But in their hour of need, they clung to any glimmer of hope. As the meeting drew to a close, the villagers dispersed, each carrying with them a renewed sense of purpose. The task ahead was daunting, and the path uncertain, but the prospect of finding a Grogok and restoring their village filled them with a resolve they had not felt in months. Valley Craig might have been shrouded in darkness, but within its people, a light of hope began to shine once more. With the weight of the village's hope resting heavily upon his shoulders, young farmer Aiden prepared for his journey. Aiden was known throughout Valley Craig for his unwavering courage and his kind heart. Tall and sturdy, with a mop of unruly brown hair and eyes that shone with determination, he embodied the spirit of the village. As he packed his modest belongings into a worn leather satchel, the villagers gathered to offer their support and well wishes. Each whispered word of encouragement and every gentle pat on the back reinforced his resolve. The morning of his departure was shrouded in a delicate mist, the sun struggling to pierce through the early haze. Aiden stood at the edge of the village, his gaze fixed on the path ahead. He knew the journey would be fraught with challenges, but the thought of his friends and family suffering spurred him on. With a final nod to the assembled crowd, he took his first steps into the unknown, the mist swallowing him almost immediately. Aiden's journey began in the dense woodlands that bordered Valley Craig. The forest was ancient, its towering trees standing as silent sentinels. 
leaves rustled softly overhead, and the scent of damp earth and pine filled the air. Guided only by the tales of old that the elders had shared, Aidan ventured deeper into the heart of the forest. He followed barely visible trails and navigated through thick underbrush, each step taking him further from the familiar. As the days turned into nights, Aidan pressed on, his determination unwavering. He traversed mist-covered valleys, where the air was thick and cool, and the ground was carpeted with lush ferns and moss. These valleys, often shrouded in an ethereal fog, seemed to belong to another world entirely. The mist clung to him like a shroud, dampening his clothes and seeping into his bones. Yet, Aidan remained undeterred his thoughts always on the village and the people he loved. The journey grew more treacherous as he climbed over steep, rocky hills. The paths were narrow and winding, the footing uncertain. Loose stones threatened to send him tumbling down the slopes, but Aidan's resolve was steadfast. He scaled craggy outcrops and navigated precarious ledges, the rugged terrain testing his endurance. Each night, he found shelter where he could. A hollow beneath an ancient oak, a small cave hidden from the elements. He would light a small fire, its flickering flames providing warmth and a sense of companionship in the solitude of the wilderness. Days blended into each other, the passage of time marked only by the changing light and the phases of the moon. Aidan's journey was long and arduous, his body growing weary with each passing day. There were moments when despair threatened to take hold, but the thought of the village, now suffering under Fomorian's curse, pushed him onward. He recalled the wise words of Kion, the old man who had first spoken of the Grogok, and the glimmer of hope that had ignited in the hearts of the villagers. Aidan was standing on the edge of a lonely glade one evening, as the sun was setting, and the sky was aflame with pink and orange hues. The soft buzz of nature and the aroma of wildflowers filled the air. A moss-covered grotto was in the middle of the glade, partially concealed by spreading ivy and rich foliage. Ancient stones encircled the entrance, their surfaces weathered with patterns that appeared to recall a long-forgotten tale. Aidan's heart quickened with a mixture of anticipation and trepidation. This had to be the place the elders spoke of, the hidden sanctuary of the Grogok. Gathering his courage, he approached the cave with reverence. He stood at its entrance, the weight of his quest bearing down upon him. With a deep breath, he called out into the darkness. Grogok, he began, his voice steady but filled with earnestness. I am Aiden, a farmer from Ballycraig. Our village is in grave danger. Fomorian, the malevolent force, has brought ruin upon our land. Our crops have withered, our livestock has vanished, and our hope is dwindling. Please, I beg of you, help us in our time of need. His words echoed softly within the cave, swallowed by the silence that followed. Aidan waited, his heart pounding in his chest. The forest around him seemed to hold its breath, the usual sounds of nature falling eerily silent. Moments stretched into what felt like an eternity, the uncertainty weighing heavily on him. 
He wondered if the Grogok would hear his plea, or if the tales of its existence were merely legend. Just as doubt began to creep into his mind, a gentle breeze stirred the air, carrying with it a faint whisper. From the depths of the moss-covered cave emerged a figure shrouded in ancient mystery and wisdom, the Grogok. This legendary being, seldom seen by mortal eyes, carried with it an aura of timeless knowledge and an air of serene power. Its form was neither fully human nor entirely spirit, but a blend of both, with features that seemed to shift like shadows in the twilight. The Grogok's eyes, deep and knowing, sparkled with an inner light that spoke of ages past and secrets untold. As Aiden watched in awe, the Grogok stepped forward, its presence filling the small clearing with a palpable sense of calm and authority. Moved by Aiden's heartfelt plea and sensing the courage and sincerity that radiated from the young farmer, the Grogok nodded slowly. It understood the gravity of the situation and the desperation that had driven Aiden to seek it out. The connection between them was immediate and profound, forged in the crucible of necessity and shared purpose. I will help you, young Aiden. The Grogok's voice was like a whisper carried on the wind, gentle yet firm. Your heart is pure, and your cause is just. Together, we shall restore balance to Bally Craig. With the Grogok's agreement, a newfound sense of hope blossomed in Aiden's chest. The journey back to Bally Craig was swift, the Grogok moving through the forest with a grace and ease that belied its otherworldly nature. Aiden followed, his steps lighter and his spirits higher than they had been in weeks. The forest, once foreboding and oppressive, now seemed alive with possibility, the leaves rustling with the promise of renewal. As they approached Bally Craig, the first rays of dawn broke the horizon, casting a golden glow over the settlement. They arrived to a picture of quiet desolation, the once luxurious fields had turned bare, and there was a general sense of melancholy in the air. But now that the Grogok was on his side, Aiden felt a renewed sense of resolve. They were going to remove the darkness that had crept into this place. The Grogok wasted no time. It moved through the village with a purposeful stride, its mere presence bringing a sense of peace and reassurance to the anxious villagers. Wherever the Grogok went, the land seemed to respond. Fields that had been withered and dry began to show signs of life. Shoots of green sprouted from the soil, and the earth itself seemed to sigh in relief. The Grogok knelt beside a particularly barren patch of land, its hands hovering over the ground. A soft, luminescent glow emanated from its fingertips, sinking into the soil and spreading like a wave. Within moments, the once desolate field was teeming with vibrant growth, the crops springing to life with renewed vigor. The villagers watched in awe and reverence, their hearts lifting with every miracle they witnessed. Livestock that had disappeared began to return, emerging from the forest with a calm assurance, as if drawn by an invisible force. The air was filled with the sounds of life once more, the lowing of cattle, the clucking of hens, and the gentle rustle of leaves in the breeze. Valley Craig, it seemed, 
was awakening from a long and terrible nightmare. But amidst the joy and relief, Aiden knew that the true test still lay ahead. The Grogok, too, understood that while the immediate damage could be repaired, the root cause of their suffering, Fomorian, remained unchallenged. They could not rest until the malevolent spirit was confronted and banished. The Grogok turned to Aiden, its expression grave but resolute. We have mended what we can for now, it said softly. But to ensure the safety and prosperity of Ballycraig, we must face Fomorian. Preparations must be made for the confrontation that lies ahead. Aiden nodded, his resolve hardening like steel. With the Grogok's guidance, he and the villagers began to prepare for the ultimate battle. They fortified the village, setting wards and protective charms around the perimeter. They gathered supplies and crafted weapons imbued with the Grogok's natural magic. Each villager played a part, their collective efforts a testament to their unity and determination. Aiden trained tirelessly, honing his skills and learning from the Grogok. The Guardian taught him the ancient ways, revealing secrets of the natural world and the delicate balance that must be maintained. Under the Grogosh's tutelage, Aiden grew not only in strength, but in wisdom. Understanding that the battle ahead was not just of physical prowess, but of wit and spirit. The night before the anticipated confrontation, the village gathered once more in the square. This time, their faces were not marred by fear but illuminated by hope and resolve. They looked to Aiden and the Grogok with trust, believing in the strength and wisdom that had been imparted to them. Tomorrow, we face our greatest challenge, Aiden spoke, his voice clear and steady. But we do not face it alone. We have the Grogok, the guardian of our land, and we have each other. Together, we will reclaim our home and our future. As the villagers dispersed to rest and ready themselves for the dawn, Aiden stood with the Grogok, gazing out over the village. The night was still and quiet, the stars twinkling like distant promises. Aiden felt a deep sense of calm wash over him, bolstered by the presence of the ancient guardian by his side. We will succeed, the Grogok said softly, its eyes reflecting the starlight. For the heart of Ballycraig beats strong and true, and no darkness can withstand the light of such unity and courage. Aiden nodded, his heart filled with hope and determination. The path ahead was clear, and with the Grogok as guidance, he felt ready to face whatever challenges awaited them. Together, they would confront the darkness, restore the balance, and ensure that the light of Ballycraig would shine brightly once more. The storm rolled in with a ferocity that mirrored the tension brewing in Ballycraig. Dark clouds gathered ominously overhead, and the wind howled through the village, rattling shutters and whipping through the trees. Lightning split the sky, illuminating the fearful faces of the villagers huddled together in their homes, peering anxiously through windows and doors. They knew the moment had come. Fomorian was here. From the depths of the shadows, the malevolent spirit rose, its form twisted and grotesque, a terrifying embodiment of chaos and despair. 
Fomorian's presence seemed to suck the very light from the air, casting an unnatural darkness over Ballycraig. The ground trembled beneath its weight, and a cold, eerie silence fell over the village, broken only by the distant rumble of thunder. In the heart of the village, Aidan and the Grogok stood ready. Aidan's heart pounded in his chest, but he remained resolute, bolstered by the Grogok's calming presence. The guardian's ethereal form glowed softly, a beacon of hope amidst the encroaching darkness. They exchanged a determined glance, a silent affirmation of their shared purpose. Fomorian surged forward, its monstrous form towering over the village. The villagers watched in fear, their hopes pinned on the brave duo who stood between them and the malevolent force. Aiden gripped his weapon tightly, feeling the weight of his responsibility, but also the strength of his resolve. This was the moment they had prepared for, the culmination of their efforts and the test of their courage. As Fomorian approached, Aiden and the Grogosh sprang into action. Aiden moved with agility and precision, using his knowledge of the land and his quick wits to outmaneuver the spirit. He darted between buildings, luring Fomorian into a carefully laid trap. The Grogok, drawing upon the ancient powers of the earth, began to weave potent spells, the air crackling with magical energy. Fomorian, sensing the threat, lashed out with a fury that shook the very foundations of the village. Dark tendrils of shadow extended from its form, seeking to ensnare Aiden and the Grogok. But Aiden, quick and nimble, evaded the attacks, guiding Fomorian closer to the trap they had set. The Grogok's spells shimmered in the air, forming an intricate web of light and energy designed to bind the spirit. With a final, desperate lunge, Fomorian charged at Aiden, its monstrous form looming over him. In that critical moment, Aiden sprang the trap. He activated the hidden wards and talismans, placed strategically around the village square. A brilliant light erupted from the ground, encircling Fomorian and halting its advance. The spirit roared in fury, thrashing against the bindings that now held it in place. The Grogok stepped forward, its eyes blazing with ancient power. Chanting in a language as old as the earth itself, it unleashed a torrent of magical energy. The air hummed with the force of the incantation, the very fabric of reality bending to the Grogok's will. Fomorian writhed in agony, the power of the spells weakening its hold on the physical world. Aiden knew this was the pivotal moment. With a shout of determination, he charged at Fomorian, his weapon glowing with the Grogok's enchantments. He struck with all his might, the blade cutting through the shadowy form of the spirit. Fomorian let out a deafening wail, its essence unraveling under the combined assault of Aiden's strength and the Grogok's magic. The battle reached its climax in a dazzling display of light and shadow. Aiden and the Grogok fought with a synchronized precision, their movements a harmonious dance of might and magic. Each strike, each spell, brought them closer to their goal. The villagers watched in awe and trepidation, their hearts pounding as they witnessed the epic clash unfold. Finally, 
with a resounding incantation that echoed through the stormy night, the Grogosh completed the binding spell. The ground beneath Fomorian opened up. A swirling vortex of light and energy, drawing the spirit back into the depths of the earth. Aiden delivered a final, decisive blow, severing the last tether that held Fomorian to the mortal realm. With a roar that shook the heavens, Fomorian was sealed back into the earth's depths. The vortex closed with a thunderous clap and a profound silence fell over Ballycraig. The storm began to abate, the clouds parting to reveal a sky studded with stars. The air was clear and fresh, the oppressive darkness lifted. Exhausted but triumphant, Aiden and the Grogok stood together in the village square. The villagers, their fear replaced by awe and gratitude, emerged from their homes, cheering and weeping with relief. The curse that had plagued Ballycraig was broken. The fields would flourish once more, and life would return to the village. Aiden, breathing heavily, looked to the Grogok, who gave a nod of satisfaction. They had faced the darkness together and emerged victorious. The bond forged in the crucible of battle would not be easily broken, and the lessons learned would be remembered for generations. As dawn broke, casting a golden light over Ballycraig, the village celebrated its heroes. Aiden and the Grogok were hailed as saviors, their bravery and sacrifice ensuring the safety and prosperity of their home. The storm had passed, and with it, a new day dawned for Ballycraig, a day filled with hope and promise. The Grogosh, though rarely seen, continued to watch over Ballycraig, ensuring that the lessons of respect and harmony endured forever. And so, my dear listeners, that was Grogok the Invisible Guardian. Aiden's courage and the Grogok's magic brought hope and renewal to Ballycraig, saving the village from the clutches of the malevolent Fomorian. Their bravery and wisdom became a beacon of light in the darkest of times. Remember, behind every shadow lies a story waiting to be uncovered and within every heart, a hero ready to emerge. If you enjoyed tonight's tale from the heart of ancient Celtic, please give it a like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you never miss another mystical story. What would you do if you were in Aiden's shoes? Would you venture into the unknown to save your village? Let us know in the comments below. Until next time, may you have sweet dreams and magical adventures every night. Dear listeners, tonight I will gently guide you through the enchanting streets of Arathor, where cobblestones whisper tales of old and a legend of bravery and wisdom comes to life. This is the story of a daring rogue and a powerful amulet, hidden for centuries, waiting to be claimed. Settle in, close your eyes, and let the soothing whispers of this story wrap around you. Mysteries of the Forgotten Tower The Wizard's Secret In the bustling heart of Arathor, a city where cobblestone streets echoed with the footsteps of adventurers and merchants alike. There lay a story that many had forgotten. A tale whispered in hushed tones. A legend buried beneath the weight of time.
Arathor, with its lively market squares and shadowy alleyways, was a place where the past and present intertwined. The laughter of children mingled with the shouts of vendors, while the clinking of coins created a melody that spoke of countless exchanges and endless possibilities. Yet, beneath this vibrant surface, the city held secrets that only the brave dared to uncover. Once, in the city's infancy, when its boundaries were still expanding and its walls freshly built, a powerful mage named Thalaran made his home in a secluded tower that overlooked the serene Silverflow River. Thalaran was not just any mage. He was a master of the arcane arts, his wisdom sought by many, and his spells feared by all who knew of them. His presence was a beacon of knowledge and power, a figure whose very name invoked a sense of awe and respect. Thalaran's tower, perched on a cliff's edge, seemed almost otherworldly. It stood tall and proud, its stone walls draped in ivy, with windows that glowed softly in the moonlight. The Silverflow River below reflected the tower's image, creating a picture of tranquility that belied the mysteries within. The tower was a place of solitude, a sanctuary where Thalaran could immerse himself in his studies, away from the prying eyes of the world. Among his many creations, there was one that stood above the rest, an amulet of extraordinary power. This amulet, forged with ancient magic and imbued with Thalaran's own essence, was said to grant immense strength and abilities to its bearer. It was a creation born of both brilliance and caution, for Thalaran understood the duality of power. He knew that in the wrong hands, such power could bring devastation and ruin. To protect the amulet from those who might misuse it, the Loren devised a series of intricate puzzles and traps. Each one was a testament to his genius, designed not only to guard the amulet, but to test the worthiness of any who dared seek it. These defenses were woven with the very fabric of magic, making them nearly impossible to overcome without a deep understanding of the arcane. The tower itself became a labyrinth of secrets, a place where only the most determined and intelligent could hope to prevail. As the years passed, Thalaran's presence in Arathor became less frequent. He withdrew deeper into his tower, his visits to the city growing rare and brief. Then, one day, he vanished entirely. His disappearance was sudden and shrouded in mystery, leaving behind only whispers and speculation. Some said he had ascended to a higher plane of existence, while others believed he had been taken by a powerful foe. Whatever the truth, Thalaran was gone, and with him, the knowledge of the amulet's exact location faded into legend. Arathor continued to grow and thrive, its streets becoming ever busier, its people ever more diverse. Yet, the story of Thalaran and his magical amulet lingered in the collective memory of the city. It became a tale told around campfires, a legend recounted in taverns. Many adventurers, drawn by the promise of unparalleled power, set out to find the amulet. They came from far and wide, each one confident in their abilities, each one certain they would succeed where others had failed. But none returned. The tower's secrets remained unbroken, its traps undefeated. That was until a daring and cunning rogue named Lyran decided to try his luck. 
Lyron wasn't your typical thief. His life had been a sequence of hardships that had sharpened his abilities and sensibilities. Growing up in the busy streets of Arathor, a city where darkness presented both safety and peril, Lyran had a deep understanding of deceit and stealth. His training area, the city's hidden corners and winding lanes, helped him acquire the fox's cunning and the cat's agility. Lyran's sharp mind and quick reflexes set him apart from the other street urchins. He could slip through the tightest of spaces and disappear into the darkest of shadows. His hands were as swift as the wind, capable of lifting a coin purse without the slightest jingle. But Lyran was not driven by greed alone. There was a fire within him, a relentless drive to prove himself, to rise above the hardships of his upbringing and achieve something greater. When whispers of Thalaran's hidden treasure reached Lyran's ears, they ignited that fire into a blazing determination. The tale of the powerful mage and his legendary amulet had long been a part of Arathor's folklore, a story that promised not just wealth, but immense power. Many had sought the treasure, but none had returned. To Lyran, this was not a deterrent, but a challenge, a testament to the magnitude of the prize. With a tattered map in hand and a heart full of resolve, Lyran set out to find the mage's tower. The journey was fraught with peril. As he ventured beyond the safety of Arathor's walls, the landscape grew wild and untamed. Dense forests stretched as far as the eye could see, their canopies thick and their paths treacherous. The air was filled with the sounds of unseen creatures, and the ground beneath his feet was uneven and riddled with roots that seemed to reach out to trip him. Yet, Lyran's resolve never wavered. His eyes remained sharp, constantly scanning the surroundings for signs of danger. He moved with the grace of a predator, silent and deliberate, his senses attuned to every rustle of leaves and snap of twigs. There were times when the forest seemed almost alive, as if it were testing his resolve, presenting him with obstacles at every turn. Lyran encountered creatures of the wild, some fierce and others cunning. There were wolves with eyes that glowed in the dark, their howls echoing through the trees, and giant spiders that spun webs as strong as steel. But Lyran was undeterred. His quick reflexes and sharp mind saw him through each encounter, his movements precise and his actions swift. He relied on his agility to evade the wolves and his cunning to outsmart the spiders, using the environment to his advantage. As he pressed on, the forest grew darker and more foreboding. The trees loomed overhead, their branches twisted and gnarled, casting eerie shadows on the ground. The path became less distinct, overgrown with thorny bushes and hidden pitfalls. But Lyran's determination was a beacon, guiding him forward through the gloom. Finally, after days of relentless travel, Lyran arrived at the tower. It stood before him, now covered in ivy and hidden deep within the dark forest. The structure was ancient, its stone walls weathered by time, but still imposing. The air around the tower was thick with magic, a palpable presence that made the hairs on the back of Lyran's neck stand on end. The ground beneath his feet seemed to whisper secrets of old, 
as if the very earth remembered the powerful mage who had once walked there. Inside the tower, Lyran faced challenges unlike any he had encountered before. The entrance hall was filled with enchanted statues that sprang to life, their stone forms moving with an unnatural fluidity. These guardians were relentless, their attacks precise, and their strength formidable. But Lyran's agility allowed him to dodge their blows, and his keen intellect helped him identify the patterns in their movements, finding the moments of vulnerability to strike back. The corridors of the tower were another test altogether. They shifted and changed, designed to disorient and confound. Walls moved, floors tilted, and paths that seemed straightforward suddenly twisted into complex mazes. Lyran's sharp mind was his greatest asset here, as he memorized the changing patterns and navigated the labyrinth with a combination of intuition and logic. He left markers to track his progress, breadcrumbs of his journey through the shifting maze. But the greatest challenge lay in the puzzles that tested his knowledge of ancient lore. Thaloran had woven his magic into these riddles, each one a testament to his genius. They required not just intelligence, but an understanding of the world of magic. Lyran had studied the old tales, learned the runes and symbols, and now that knowledge was put to the test, he deciphered cryptic inscriptions, matched symbols to unlock doors, and solved riddles that required both thought and intuition. Each step forward brought Lyran closer to the amulet, but also deeper into danger. The air grew heavier with magic, the very walls seeming to hum with power. But with every challenge he overcame, Lyran's confidence grew. His journey had forged him into something more than a thief. He was a seeker of legends, a challenger of fate. The toughest test was yet ahead of Lyran as he ventured deeper into the tower's interior. But he was unwavering in his resolve, driven by the hope of Thaloran's riches and the conviction that he was meant to succeed where so many others had failed. He was prepared to confront whatever lied ahead. Thus, Lyran persevered with unwavering resolve, prepared to reveal the mysteries of the mage's tower. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Lyran reached the heart of the tower. Each step he took reverberated through the ancient stone echoing the countless footsteps of those who had come before him, only to fail. The air was thick with anticipation and magic, a tangible presence that made the very walls seem alive. Lyran's heart pounded in his chest, not from fear, but from the weight of the moment. He had come so far, faced so many challenges, and now, he stood on the precipice of his greatest trial. There, in the center of the chamber, on a pedestal bathed in ethereal light, lay the amulet. Its surface glowed with an otherworldly sheen, a soft, pulsating light that seemed to beckon him closer. The amulet was exquisite, a perfect blend of artistry and magic its intricate designs shimmering as if alive. Lyran could feel its power even from a distance, a subtle yet undeniable pull that resonated deep within him. It was as if the amulet recognized him, acknowledged his journey, and called out to him as its rightful bearer. 
as he reached out to claim the amulet. The air around him grew colder, and a ghostly figure materialized before him, Thalaran himself. The mage's spirit was a formidable presence, his eyes glowing with an intense light, his form translucent, yet imposing. Thalaran had bound himself to the amulet, ensuring its protection, even in death. His expression was stern, a mixture of curiosity and caution as he gazed upon Lyran. Who dares to claim my creation? Thalaran's voice echoed through the chamber, a sound that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere all at once. It was a voice filled with authority and wisdom, carrying the weight of centuries. Lyran, though taken aback by the sudden appearance, stood his ground. He had come too far to falter now. I am Lyran, and I seek the amulet. I have faced your trials and emerged victorious. Thalaran's eyes narrowed, and he floated closer, his ethereal form shimmering in the magical light. Many have claimed such a right, yet none have proven worthy. The amulet is not for the faint of heart or the weak of mind. It requires strength, wisdom, and a pure intent. Are you prepared to be tested, Lyran? Lyran nodded, his resolve unwavering. I am ready. And so began the battle of wits and will. Thalaran challenged Lyran with puzzles and riddles, each one more complex than the last. They were not merely tests of intelligence, but of character and intent. The spirit of the mage sought to uncover the true nature of the man before him, to see if he was indeed worthy of such power. Lyran used every ounce of his cunning to outsmart the spectral guardian. His mind raced as he solved ancient riddles, his eyes scanning the chamber for clues hidden in the architecture and the magical symbols that adorned the walls. Each puzzle was a test of his knowledge of the arcane, of his ability to think critically under pressure. But more than that, it was a test of his integrity and determination. Thalaran watched closely, his expression unreadable, as Lyran navigated through the challenges. The mage's spirit probed Lyran's thoughts, his motives, seeking any sign of unworthiness. But Lyran's heart was true. He did not seek the amulet for selfish gain, but for the potential to protect and to grow. His journey had forged him into a man of honor, and his actions reflected that. The final challenge was the most daunting, a riddle that required not just knowledge, but profound wisdom and empathy. Thalaran's voice, softer now, posed the question, what is the greatest power that one can wield, yet the most perilous to possess? Lyran paused, the weight of the question settling upon him. He reflected on his journey, on the trials he had faced, and the lessons he had learned. And then, with a clarity that came from deep within, he answered, The greatest power is the power of choice to choose to wield power with compassion, to use it for the greater good, and not for selfish ends. It is perilous, because it requires constant vigilance and humility. Thalaran's spirit smiled, a look of satisfaction in his ethereal eyes. You have answered wisely, Lyran. The amulet shall be yours. But remember, with great power, comes great responsibility. Use it well, and it will serve you faithfully. With those words, the spirit of Thalaran began to fade, 
his duty fulfilled. The chamber grew warmer, and the light around the amulet intensified. Lyron stepped forward, his hand trembling slightly as he reached out and took the amulet. As his fingers closed around it, he felt a surge of energy, a connection to the very essence of the magical artifact. Lyran's journey had brought him to this moment, and he had proven himself worthy. The amulet, a symbol of immense power and responsibility, was now his to bear. And with it, the legacy of Thalaran, the wise and powerful mage, would continue through Lyran, the daring and cunning rogue who had risen to meet his destiny. With the powerful artifact in hand, Lyran returned to Arathor. The journey back through the dense, enchanted forest felt different this time. The trees, once menacing and foreboding, seemed to part willingly for him as if recognizing the power he now carried. The path, once treacherous and winding, felt smoother under his feet, as if the very earth acknowledged his triumph. The amulet, a source of immense power, pulsed gently against his chest, a constant reminder of the responsibility that now rested upon his shoulders. As he approached the city's gates, the bustling sounds of Arathor welcomed him back. The familiar clatter of horse-drawn carts, the lively chatter of merchants, and the distant laughter of children filled the air. Yet, beneath this vibrant tapestry, there was an undercurrent of unease. Whispers of unseen threats and looming dangers had begun to circulate through the streets, casting a shadow over the city's lively atmosphere. Lyran, now armed with the unparalleled abilities bestowed by the amulet, felt a renewed sense of purpose. He was no longer just a thief, skilled in the arts of stealth and deception. He had become something more, a guardian, a protector of Arathor, the amulet had not only amplified his physical abilities, but also heightened his senses, giving him a deeper understanding of the magical forces at play in the world. Word of his return spread quickly through the city. The once forgotten rogue, who had dared to challenge the mysteries of Thalaran's tower and succeeded, was now a figure of awe and respect. People spoke of his courage and determination, of how he had braved the ancient mage's trials and emerged victorious. His legend grew with each retelling, painting him as a hero who had returned to safeguard the city from threats both seen and unseen. Lyran's new role was not without its challenges. The amulet's power was a double-edged sword, demanding wisdom and restraint. He understood that its true strength lay not in raw force, but in the judicious application of its magic. It required him to be vigilant, to constantly weigh his choices and consider the greater good. The responsibility was immense, but Lyran embraced it wholeheartedly. In the days and weeks that followed his return, Lyran's presence became a reassuring constant for the people of Arathor. He used the amulet's abilities to enhance his already formidable skills, moving through the city with an almost supernatural grace. He thwarted would-be thieves with a mere flick of his wrist, dismantling their plans before they even had a chance to unfold. He uncovered hidden plots against the city, using the amulet's power 
to perceive the intentions of those who meant harm. But Lyron's influence extended beyond mere protection. He became a symbol of hope and resilience for the citizens of Arathor. His story inspired others to rise above their circumstances, to strive for greatness despite the odds. He mentored young thieves, teaching them the value of honor and integrity, and showed them that true strength lay not in cunning alone, but in the courage to do what was right. One night, as Lyron stood atop the city's tallest tower, overlooking the sprawling streets below, he reflected on his journey. The amulet, now a familiar weight around his neck, seemed to hum in harmony with his thoughts. He realized that the greatest treasure he had gained was not the power of the amulet itself, but the understanding of what it meant to wield such power responsibly. Thalaran's legacy had been one of wisdom and foresight, and Lyran knew that it was now his duty to honor that legacy. The story of Thalaran's amulet and the daring rogue who claimed it became one of Arathor's most cherished tales. It was told and retold in taverns and around campfires, a testament to the enduring power of courage and wisdom. Parents recounted the legend to their children, emphasizing the importance of integrity and the value of true strength. Bards composed songs celebrating Lyran's exploits, ensuring that his legacy would live on for generations to come. As a legend in his own right, Lyran's name grew to represent courage and morality. He persisted in keeping Arathor safe, watching out for any shadows that would jeopardize its tranquility. Once a secret treasure, the amulet has come to represent hope and unification for the populace. It serves as a reminder that sometimes the greatest treasures are found in the bravery and discernment of those who seek them out, rather than in gold or jewels. And so, dear listeners, we come to the end of our tale. This has been Mysteries of the Forgotten Tower. Our brave rogue uncovered the secrets of Thalaran's tower and claimed the powerful amulet, using its magic not for selfish gain, but to protect the city of Arathor. His courage and wisdom shone brightly, guiding him through every challenge he faced. Remember, behind every shadow lies a story waiting to be discovered, and within every heart a hero may dwell. If you enjoyed tonight's journey through the enchanted streets of Arathor, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so you never miss another mystical tale. What would you do if you were in Lyran's place? Would you embrace the amulet's power or choose a different path? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, may you have sweet dreams and magical adventures each night. Dear listeners, tonight I will take you on a journey into the shadowy depths of the desert, where an ancient and terrifying legend comes to life, the curse of the Egyptian god Anubis. Picture the vast, scorching sands stretching out endlessly beneath the merciless sun, and at its heart, a hidden temple waiting to reveal its dark secrets. Settle in comfortably, close your eyes, and let yourselves be enveloped by this tale of courage, mystery, and the relentless pursuit of truth. 
shadows of Anubis face the curse of Egyptian God. Under the scorching sun of the vast desert, a group of courageous explorers embarked on a journey that would change their lives forever. Led by the renowned archaeologist Dr. Elena Radcliffe, they were a team driven by an unquenchable thirst for knowledge and the promise of uncovering the mysteries of the ancient world. Their destination, a temple dedicated to the Egyptian god Anubis, long lost to the sands of time. The entrance to this forgotten sanctuary had been hidden for millennia beneath the shifting sands, waiting for the day it would be revealed once more. The team had spent months deciphering ancient maps and inscriptions, their excitement growing with each clue that brought them closer to their goal. And now, standing before the ancient stone doorway, their hearts pounded with anticipation. The desert heat bore down on them, but it was the thrill of discovery that truly set their blood racing. As they carefully cleared away the last of the sand and debris, the entrance loomed before them, dark and foreboding. The carvings on the stone, though worn by the ages, still held an aura of reverence and mystery. They depicted scenes of Anubis, the jackal-headed god of the afterlife, guiding souls through the underworld. Each figure seemed to watch them, eyes following their every movement, as if judging their worthiness to enter this sacred space. With a deep breath, Dr. Radcliffe led her team into the temple's shadowy depths. The air inside was cool and stale, a stark contrast to the blazing desert outside. Each step they took echoed through the stone corridors, the sound amplifying the sense of solitude and isolation. They moved slowly, methodically, their flashlights casting eerie shadows on the walls. Only the gentle ruffle of sand and the sporadic drop of water broke the deafening calm as they descended farther. They could feel history bearing down on them more and more as they descended. The temple's walls seemed to be whispering tales about a bygone era, when it was a center of power and worship. Then, the phenomena began. At first, it was subtle, a flicker of movement at the edge of their vision, a shadow that seemed to shift when no one was looking directly at it. They dismissed it as a trick of the light, a product of their tired minds and the dim illumination of their flashlights. But as they continued, the occurrences grew more frequent and harder to ignore. Shadows danced along the walls, moving with a life of their own. They twisted and writhed, forming shapes that were almost human, almost familiar. Dr. Radcliffe felt a chill run down her spine as she watched one particularly dark shadow stretch out a hand, as if reaching for something just out of reach. She blinked, and it was gone. Whispers began to fill the air, soft and indistinct at first, but growing clearer with each passing moment. They spoke in ancient tongues, voices from the past that seemed to plead and warn. The team exchanged uneasy glances, each member feeling the same creeping dread. The whispers grew louder, forming words that none of them understood. Yet the meaning was clear. They were not alone. Then came the apparitions. Ghostly figures of ancient priests, 
their forms translucent and ethereal, began to appear. They moved with purpose, their eyes glowing with an unearthly light. These spectral guardians seemed to be reliving moments from their lives, performing rituals and prayers to Anubis. The explorers watched in awe and fear, unsure whether these spirits were there to guide them or to ward them off. Dr. Radcliffe stood transfixed as one of the priests turned to face her, his eyes meeting hers with a gaze that pierced through to her very soul. She felt a connection, a bridge across time, and for a moment, she understood the weight of their journey. This was not just an archaeological expedition. It was a communion with the past, a chance to uncover truths that had been buried for thousands of years. The atmosphere grew tense with each passing moment. The explorers moved forward, driven by a mix of curiosity and fear. The shadows Whispers and apparitions seemed to be leading them deeper into the labyrinth, drawing them towards something that lay hidden in the heart of the temple. The air grew thicker, the sense of anticipation mounting with every step. Dr. Radcliffe could feel the unease growing among her team. They were seasoned explorers, each one a veteran of many such expeditions. But this was different. There was a presence here, a force that watched and waited. They could all sense it, a looming shadow that seemed to pulse with a life of its own. They pressed on, driven by the promise of history unveiled, yet wary of the ancient darkness that surrounded them. The temple, once a place of worship and reverence, had become a place of shadows and secrets. And as they ventured further into its depths, they realized that they were on the brink of a discovery that would challenge everything they knew about the ancient world and the mysteries it held. In the heart of the desert, under the watchful gaze of Anubis, the explorers were about to uncover the secrets of the past. But what they did not yet know was that the shadows held more than just memories. They held the key to a power that had been waiting to be unleashed for millennia. And as they continued their descent into the darkness, they could only hope that they would emerge unscathed on the other side. Mark was one of the brave adventurers who braved the ancient temple. He was a seasoned traveler with an unquenchable curiosity and an eye for detail. Mark was well known for his attention to detail and keen intuition, and he had a talent for finding secret information in the most improbable places. This exact ability allowed him to make a startling discovery that would drastically alter the path of their journey, deep in the temple's gloomy passageways. As the team carefully navigated the labyrinthine passages, Mark found himself drawn to a small, dimly lit alcove. Something about it called to him, a faint whisper in the back of his mind urging him to explore further. With deliberate steps, he approached the alcove, his flashlight casting long, eerie shadows on the ancient stone walls. There, nestled in the dust and debris of centuries, he spotted something remarkable, an ancient manuscript. The manuscript was fragile, its pages brittle with age, whispering secrets of the past as he gently handled them. The cover was adorned with intricate hieroglyphics and symbols that spoke of a time 
long forgotten. Mark's heart raced with excitement as he carefully opened it, revealing the delicate, yellowed pages within. Each page was filled with beautifully crafted script, a testament to the skill and reverence of its creators. A shiver went down Mark's spine as he started to decipher the old writing. The document described the heart of Anubis, a mysterious relic endowed with the ability to regulate life and death. The document said that the artifact was concealed by strong curses and antiquated magic deep within the temple. This item was claimed to possess the potential to bend reality itself, a capability that might either rescue or destroy anyone who sought it. The more Mark read, the heavier the weight of dread that settled over him. The manuscript revealed that the temple was cursed, a malevolent force that had lain dormant for millennia. This curse, it explained, could only be lifted by finding and destroying the heart of Anubis. Failure to do so would result in dire consequences, a fate worse than death for those who dared to disturb the temple's sanctity. As Mark shared his findings with the rest of the team, a palpable sense of fear began to take hold. The weight of the revelation hung heavy in the air, each member of the team processing the enormity of what they had uncovered. The once exhilarating promise of discovery now carried with it a dark and foreboding shadow. They realized that they were not just exploring an ancient temple. They were entwined in a struggle against forces beyond their understanding. Tensions began to flare as the team pressed on, each step deeper into the temple, feeling like a step closer to an uncertain doom. The knowledge of the curse weighed heavily on their minds, amplifying the sense of unease that had been building since they first entered the temple. Whispers of fear and doubt began to circulate, eroding the camaraderie and trust that had once bound them together. Mark could see the strain in their faces, the fear that flickered in their eyes. Each member of the team was grappling with their own demons, the knowledge of the curse gnawing at their resolve. As they ventured further, the temple seemed to come alive with malevolent energy, the shadows growing darker and more oppressive. The whispers grew louder, more insistent, echoing off the stone walls and filling their minds with dread. It wasn't long before the curse began to claim its first victims. One by one, members of the team fell prey to the malevolent force that permeated the temple. Their bodies would convulse and writhe as if possessed by an unseen entity, their screams echoing through the dark corridors. And then, in a horrifying transformation, their physical forms would dissolve into shadows, merging with the darkness that surrounded them. These shadows, once human, now moved with a sinister purpose, their eyes glowing with an eerie light. They seemed to be under the control of Anubis, the ancient god watching over his domain. The loss of their comrades was a heavy blow, each transformation a grim reminder of the curse's power and the urgency of their quest. The remaining members of the team grew more desperate, their fear fueling their determination to find and destroy the heart of Anubis. Even though Mark felt guilty and sad 
for his buddies who had died. He knew they had to keep on. A ray of hope had appeared in the form of the manuscript, offering them a means of breaking the curse and avoiding the same destiny. However, the route ahead was treacherous, with each step bringing them nearer to the temple center, and the relic that either held the key to their redemption or their destruction. As the team moved forward, the atmosphere grew ever more oppressive. The shadows seemed to close in around them, the whispers growing louder and more urgent. Every corner held the potential for new horrors, every step echoing with the fear of the unknown. Yet, driven by the knowledge of what was at stake, they continued their perilous journey into the depths of the temple. Mark clutched the ancient manuscript tightly, its fragile pages a constant reminder of the curse they faced and the task that lay ahead. With each step, he felt the weight of their mission pressing down on him, the lives of his comrades, and the fate of their expedition resting on his shoulders. The heart of Anubis awaited them in the darkness, a beacon of hope and danger in equal measure. And as they ventured deeper into the shadowy labyrinth, they could only hope that their courage and determination would be enough to see them through the trials that lay ahead. With their numbers dwindling and the shadows closing in, Dr. Elena Radcliffe and the few remaining members of her team knew they were in a desperate race against time. The ancient temple, with its hidden corridors and malevolent presence, was not just a place of discovery anymore. It was a labyrinth of danger and despair. They had to find the heart of Anubis the mystical artifact that held the key to lifting the curse, and they had to find it quickly. The ghostly priest, an ethereal guardian bound to the temple, emerged from the shadows to offer cryptic guidance. His form was translucent, flickering in the dim light of their flashlights. His eyes, glowing with an otherworldly light, held a mixture of sorrow and urgency. He spoke in riddles, his voice a soft whisper that seemed to echo from the very walls of the temple. Each clue he provided was a puzzle, a test of their resolve and intellect. Seek the chamber where the light does not touch, the priest intoned, his voice like a breeze rustling through ancient leaves. There, beneath the gaze of Anubis, lies the heart that beats with life and death. Dr. Radcliffe listened intently, her mind racing to piece together the meaning behind his words. She could feel the weight of her responsibility pressing down on her, the lives of her remaining team members, and the souls of those lost depending on her. She could not afford to falter. Not now when they were so close. Guided by the priest's cryptic clues, they navigated through the temple's treacherous passages. Each step they took was fraught with peril, the walls seemingly closing in around them, the air growing heavier with each breath. They encountered deadly traps, remnants of an age when the temple had been a place of sacred rites and powerful magic. Ancient mechanisms, long dormant, sprang to life as they passed, spewing darts and igniting flames in a final, desperate bid to protect the secrets within. Despite the increasing danger, Dr. Radcliffe's determination never wavered. Her heart pounded with fear, but it also surged with resolve. 
she led her team with unwavering focus, her keen intellect deciphering the priest's riddles and guiding them through the maze of death traps and hidden passages. Each clue, each step, brought them closer to the final chamber, but also closer to their own doom. The spectral priest appeared again, his presence a mix of comfort and foreboding. The path to the heart is lined with the souls of the damned, he whispered, his voice a mournful dirge. Tread carefully, for they guard the way with their eternal vigilance. The team moved cautiously, their flashlights cutting through the thick darkness. Shadows danced on the walls, and the air was thick with the weight of ancient sorrows. They could feel the eyes of the damned upon them, restless spirits bound to the temple by the curse. The air grew colder, the oppressive silence broken only by the faint rustle of unseen movements and the distant echoes of their own footsteps. As they pressed on, the clues became more obscure, the path more perilous. They encountered murals and carvings that depicted scenes of judgment and retribution, the imagery both beautiful and terrifying. Each image seemed to pulse with a life of its own, the eyes of Anubis watching their every move. The sense of being watched, judged, and tested grew stronger with each passing moment. Dr. Radcliffe led her team through a narrow corridor, the walls closing in until they were forced to move single file. The air was thick with the scent of ancient dust and the faint tang of fear. Ahead of them, a faint glow illuminated the end of the corridor, a doorway framed by the intricate carvings of Anubis and his jackal-headed minions. This must be it, she whispered, her voice barely audible above the thundering of her heart. The final chamber. The spectral priest appeared once more, his form wavering like a candle flame in the darkness. Beyond this door lies the heart, he said his voice heavy with the weight of centuries. But beware, for the guardians will not let it go easily. Only the pure of heart, the brave of spirit, will succeed. With a deep breath, Dr. Radcliffe pushed open the door. In the heart of the ancient temple, the air was thick with tension, and the weight of ages past. Dr. Elena Radcliffe and her remaining team members stood at the threshold of the secret chamber, their faces illuminated by the eerie glow emanating from within. The heart of Anubis, a crystalline artifact pulsating with dark energy, lay at the center of the room, casting long shadows that danced along the stone walls. As they stepped into the chamber, a palpable sense of foreboding enveloped them. The air seemed to hum with an unearthly energy, the vibrations resonating through their very bones. Each step they took was measured and cautious, their eyes fixed on the glowing crystal that held the key to their salvation. The shadows in the room began to close in, swirling around them like dark phantoms, their presence an ominous reminder of the power they were about to confront. Dr. Radcliffe's heart pounded in her chest as she approached the heart of Anubis. The artifact seemed to pulse in response, its dark energy growing more intense with each passing moment. She could feel the weight of the ancient curse pressing down on her, the souls trapped within the crystal 
crying out for release. Her determination to end their suffering and lift the curse drove her forward, despite the overwhelming fear that gnawed at the edges of her resolve. The temple began to quake, the very foundations trembling as if in protest of their intrusion. Stones shifted, and dust fell from the ceiling, the ancient structure groaning under the strain. The team exchanged anxious glances, their breaths quickening as the intensity of the situation escalated. The shadows grew darker and more oppressive, their forms twisting and writhing as they closed in around the explorers. In a climactic moment of bravery, Dr. Radcliffe reached out and grasped the heart of Anubis. The instant her fingers made contact with the crystal, a surge of dark energy coursed through her, filling her with a chilling cold. She could feel the ancient power of the artifact, a force that had been waiting millennia to be unleashed. Summoning all her strength and determination, she lifted the crystal high above her head, ready to end the curse once and for all. With a primal scream that echoed through the chamber, Dr. Radcliffe brought the crystal crashing down onto the stone altar. The heart of Anubis shattered into a thousand pieces, each shard pulsating briefly before fading into nothingness. A blinding flash of light filled the room, and the shadows let out a collective wail as they began to dissipate, their dark forms dissolving into the air. The temple's trembling grew more violent, the ancient stones cracking and shifting as the structure began to collapse around them. Dr. Radcliffe and her team scrambled to escape, navigating the crumbling passageways with a desperate urgency. The ground beneath them shook, and debris rained down from above. The once majestic temple, now a chaotic ruin. They pushed forward, their breaths ragged and their bodies aching, driven by the primal instinct to survive. As they burst through the temple's entrance and into the blinding sunlight, a sense of profound relief washed over them. They stumbled into the open desert, collapsing onto the warm sand as the temple behind them continued to fall into ruin. The oppressive weight of the curse lifted, and the air seemed clear. The whispers and shadows that had haunted them finally gone. Dr. Radcliffe lay on the sand, her chest heaving with exhaustion, her mind reeling from the intensity of their ordeal. She had lost friends, comrades who had ventured into the depths with her and paid the ultimate price. The pain of those losses marked her, a heavy burden that she would carry with her always. But alongside that, pain was a sense of triumph, a deep satisfaction that they had succeeded in their mission. As she gazed at the ruins of the temple, now bathed in the golden light of the setting sun, Dr. Radcliffe felt a newfound understanding of the past and the mystical forces that had shaped it. The curse of Anubis was finally broken, the trapped souls released from their millennia-long torment. The ancient secrets they had uncovered would not be forgotten, but would serve as a testament to the bravery and determination of her team. The surviving members of the expedition gathered around her, their faces etched with a mixture of relief and sorrow. They had endured so much, faced unimaginable horrors, 
and emerged victorious. With the curse lifted, they felt a renewed sense of purpose and resolve. They vowed to continue their explorations, to seek out the mysteries of the past with the same courage and tenacity that had brought them through this harrowing ordeal. Dr. Radcliffe stood, her gaze fixed on the horizon, the sun casting long shadows behind her. She knew that their journey was far from over, that there were still countless wonders and dangers awaiting them in the world. But for now, they had triumphed over the darkness, and the light of their success would guide them forward. After taking one last, long glance at the temple's remnants, Dr. Radcliffe faced her group. Buoyed by the knowledge that they had battled Anubis's shadows and prevailed over them, they set forth across the desert together. Ahead of them lay an infinite future full with opportunities and the prospect of exciting new experiences. And as they strolled, the sun disappeared beyond the horizon, revealing a sky filled with hues, symbolic of rebirth and optimism. And so, my dear listeners, that was Shadows of Anubis. Dr. Elena Radcliffe and her courageous team uncovered the ancient mysteries and lifted the curse that had plagued the temple for millennia. Their bravery and determination shone through the darkest depths of the temple, bringing light and hope where there was once only shadow and despair. Remember, behind every shadow lies a story waiting to be told, and within every ancient relic, a truth yearning to be discovered. If you enjoyed tonight's journey into the heart of the desert and the secrets it held, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you never miss another tale of mystery and adventure. What would you have done in Dr. Radcliffe's place? Would you have dared to venture into the depths of the unknown to lift an ancient curse? Let us know in the comments below. Until next time, may you have sweet dreams and magical adventures in every night. Dear listeners, Tonight, I will take you on a journey through the mist-covered hills and ancient valleys of the Isle of Skye, where a tale of magic, bravery, and unity unfolds. The legend of Lachlan MacLeod, a young clan chief whose quest for mystical stones leads him to confront ancient spirits and forge alliances, comes to life in a story that bridges the realms of the past and the present. Sit back, close your eyes, and let yourself be enveloped by the enchanting and timeless story of the Fog of Sky. The Fog of Sky, The Highland Mysteries In the heart of the Isle of Sky, where rolling mists wove through the ancient hills and valleys like spectral fingers. Young Lachlan MacLeod bore the weight of leadership on his broad shoulders. As the newly appointed chief of the MacLeod clan, he was acutely aware of the challenges and responsibilities that came with his title. The days were filled with the constant demands of his people, the intricate politics of clan alliances, and the ever-present threat of rival clans seeking to undermine his rule. Lachlan's mind was a tumultuous sea of worries, and he sought solace in the wild beauty 
of his homeland. One evening, the fog lay thick upon the land, shrouding everything in an almost supernatural stillness. The air was heavy with moisture, and the world seemed to shrink to the immediate surroundings, each footstep muffled by the dense mist. It was on such an evening that Lachlan decided to take a solitary walk along the rugged coastline, hoping the cool air and rhythmic crashing of the waves would offer him some clarity. The path was treacherous, with jagged rocks jutting out at odd angles. But Lachlan moved with the sure-footedness of one who knew the land intimately. As he walked, his thoughts drifted to the legends of his people, tales of ancient magic and powerful relics hidden within the island's depths. His ancestors spoke of a time when the land itself seemed alive with enchantment, and he wondered if there was any truth to these old stories. Lost in thought, Lachlan almost missed the narrow entrance to a cave, half concealed by a curtain of ivy and mist. Something about it caught his eye, a subtle shimmer perhaps, or a fleeting glint of light. Intrigued, and with a sense of destiny tingling in his veins, Lachlan approached the cave. He hesitated at the entrance, feeling a chill run down his spine. The air inside was cooler, the silence profound. Taking a deep breath, he stepped into the darkness, his footsteps echoing softly against the stone walls. As his eyes adjusted to the dim light, he saw the source of the shimmer, a stone unlike any he had ever seen, resting on a natural pedestal in the center of the cavern. The stone was mesmerizing, emitting a soft, eerie glow that pulsed gently, like a heartbeat. Its surface was smooth and polished, with intricate patterns that seemed to shift and change as he watched. A strange, otherworldly aura emanated from it, drawing him closer with an almost magnetic pull. Lachlan felt his heart race, a mix of fear and fascination. He reached out a hand, compelled by an inexplicable urge to touch the stone. The moment his fingers brushed the smooth surface, the cave was flooded with an intense, otherworldly light. It was as if the stone had awakened, responding to his touch with a surge of energy. Lachlan felt the ground beneath him tremble and then dissolve, as if he were being pulled into the very fabric of the stone itself. The sensation was disorienting, and he could do nothing but surrender to the overwhelming force that seemed to envelop him. He was plunged into a vortex of swirling light and color, a tunnel that seemed to stretch on for eternity. Time lost all meaning, and Lachlan felt himself drifting, suspended in a state of pure, ethereal energy. Just as suddenly as it began, the sensation ended with a jarring thud. Lachlan found himself lying on cold, hard ground, the air filled with a cacophony of clashing swords and battle cries. Dazed and disoriented, he struggled to his feet, taking in his surroundings. He was no longer in the cave, no longer on the Isle of Skye he knew. The landscape was foreign yet familiar the air charged with the tension of imminent violence. He had been transported back in time, to a medieval Scotland torn by fierce clan rivalries and constant warfare. Lachlan's heart pounded as he realized the gravity of his situation. He was dressed in the garb of a Highlander, his sword at his side. 
the sounds of battle drew closer, and he instinctively grasped the hilt of his weapon. There was no time to ponder how or why he had been brought here. The survival instincts, honed by his years as a warrior and leader, kicked in. He had to navigate this perilous new world and find a way back to his own time. Lachlan looked around him at the disorganized situation. Warriors engaged in vicious fight, while the flags of several clans fluttered in the agitated atmosphere. It smelled so bad, like sweat and blood. Stealing himself, Lachlan realized he needed to go swiftly and aggressively. Despite not knowing this time, he was aware of the battle's regulations. He needed to find a way home, find answers, and survive. The sound of metal clanging, wounded people screaming, and the ferocious intensity of soldiers engaged in deadly conflict filled the air. Though Lachlan's heart was racing, his instincts from the battlefield and years of training soon took control. Pulling out his sword, he readied himself to defend himself. Amidst the swirling melee, Lachlan's sharp eyes caught sight of a young warrior, barely older than himself, beset by foes. The young man's back was against a large rock, his movements desperate and defensive. Lachlan did not hesitate. Charging forward, he cut through the mass of bodies, his sword moving with deadly precision. Each strike was calculated, each parry a testament to his skill. He fought his way to the embattled youth, his blade flashing in the dim light of the overcast sky. Lachlan reached the young warrior, just as a particularly vicious-looking clansman raised his weapon for a killing blow. With a powerful swing, Lachlan deflected the attack and drove his sword through the assailant. The enemy fell, eyes wide with surprise, and Lachlan turned to face the next threat. Together, he and the young warrior fought side by side, their movements becoming an unspoken dance of survival and ferocity. Lachlan's presence and prowess were enough to turn the tide, and soon the attackers began to retreat, their will to fight broken. Breathing heavily, Lachlan finally had a moment to look at the young man he had saved. The warrior, though bloodied and battered, still held a fire in his eyes. He nodded his thanks, a gesture of deep gratitude and respect. I owe you my life, the young man said his voice steady, despite the adrenaline coursing through his veins. I am Ewan, son of the Campbell clan leader. The revelation struck Lachlan like a thunderbolt. The MacLeods and Campbells had a long history of animosity, their relationship fraught with mistrust and bloodshed. Yet here, in the heat of battle, those old enmities seemed distant and irrelevant. Lachlan introduced himself, and though he saw a flicker of recognition, and perhaps wariness, in Ewan's eyes, the young Campbell did not hesitate to extend his hand in friendship. Despite the historic enmity between their clans, Ewan's gratitude forged an uneasy but sincere alliance. He led Lachlan through the battlefield's aftermath, weaving between the injured and the fallen. As they approached the Campbell camp, Lachlan could feel the weight of many eyes upon him. The Campbells were cautious, their gazes wary, but they did not turn him away. 
Ewan's endorsement carried significant weight, and Lachlan knew he had earned a fragile acceptance. The Campbell camp was a hive of activity, warriors tending to their wounds and preparing for the next inevitable conflict. Ewan brought Lachlan to a central tent where the clan leaders gathered. As they entered, the conversations hushed, and all eyes turned to the newcomers. Ewan spoke first, recounting the battle and Lachlan's decisive role in saving his life. There was a murmur of approval, but also a lingering skepticism. The Campbell chieftain, a grizzled warrior with eyes as sharp as flint, stepped forward. You have shown great bravery, Lachlan MacLeod, he said, his voice a gravelly rumble. For that, you have our respect and our thanks. But know this, trust is not easily given, and old wounds are slow to heal. Lachlan met the chieftain's gaze squarely. I understand and I ask for nothing more than the chance to prove myself. I seek answers about a mysterious stone and the path it has set me upon. I believe our fates are intertwined. There was a moment of silence as the Campbells weighed his words. Finally, the chieftain nodded. You will stay with us then as an ally. But remember, our trust must be earned. Lachlan accepted their terms, knowing that his survival and quest for answers depended on building a foundation of trust and mutual respect. The days that followed were filled with challenges and opportunities to prove his worth. He participated in their councils, sharing his insights and strategies, and joined them in their daily routines, from training drills to patrols. Slowly, the wary glances became nods of acknowledgement, and the cautious distance shortened. Through it all, Ewan remained at Lachlan's side, a steadfast ally and friend. The bond they had forged in the heat of battle grew stronger, and Lachlan began to see the Campbells not as enemies, but as potential partners in a shared destiny. He learned about their customs and traditions, their hopes and fears, and found common ground in their desire for peace and stability. Yet, even as Lachlan integrated himself into the Campbell clan, he never lost sight of his ultimate goal. The mysterious stone that had brought him to this time and place remained at the forefront of his thoughts. He sought out the wisdom of the elders, listened to the tales of old, and pieced together fragments of ancient knowledge. He realized that the stone was not merely a relic, but a key to something far greater, a force that could change the course of history itself. Lachlan MacLeod continued to explore the mysteries of the medieval world he had been thrown into as the days turned into weeks. The rough splendor of the Scottish Highlands served as both his haven and his testing ground. He learned that the mysterious stone he had found in the cave was actually one of several magical stones strewn over the region, all of which were protected by powerful powers and steeped in old legend. Legend had it that these stones could change history itself and even determine people's fates. Lachlan realized that finding these stones might be his only way to return to his own time and secure the future of his clan. With this knowledge, he embarked on a perilous quest, determined to uncover the secrets of the magical relics. By his side was Ewan, 
the son of the Campbell clan leader. Though their alliance was born of necessity, a growing camaraderie and mutual respect fortified their bond. Their journey took them through some of the most treacherous terrains the Highlands had to offer. From the mist-laden peaks of the mountains, where visibility was often reduced to mere feet, to the dense, shadowy forests that seemed to whisper of forgotten secrets, Lachlan and Ewan faced challenges that tested their resolve and resourcefulness. Each step of their quest was fraught with danger, but it was also a path of discovery and growth. The first of the stones lay hidden in the heart of a vast, ancient forest. The trees there were tall and gnarled, their branches entwined like the fingers of giants. The air was thick with the scent of pine and moss, and an eerie silence pervaded the wood, broken only by the occasional rustle of unseen creatures. As they ventured deeper, the forest seemed to close in around them, the light dimming as if reluctant to penetrate the thick canopy overhead. This is where they first came upon the first protector, an old and knowledgeable woodland spirit. The apparition of the spirit was a magnificent buck, whose antlers emitted a gentle phantom light. Its deep, wise eyes watched them with caution and interest mixed together. Lachlan and Ewan had to solve a number of puzzles that tested their understanding of nature and their cooperation skills in order to obtain the stone. Although the riddles were difficult and relied on the forest's secret wisdom, they were solved with persistence and teamwork. The second stone awaited them in a cavern high in the misty mountains. The journey to reach it was arduous, the path steep and strewn with loose rocks. The higher they climbed, the colder and thinner the air became. Lachlan and Ewan had to battle the elements, their progress hampered by sudden storms and treacherous footing. Yet, their determination never wavered. They reached the cavern, a yawning maw in the mountainside, its entrance guarded by a fierce and ancient spirit, a dragon of stone and fire. This guardian was not one to be outwitted by mere riddles. Instead, it demanded a trial of strength and bravery. Lachlan and Ewan had to face the dragon's fiery breath and navigate a labyrinth of traps and challenges within the cavern. It was a grueling test, pushing them to their physical and mental limits. Through their combined strength and unwavering resolve, they emerged victorious, the second stone claimed as their prize. Their quest led them next to the shores of a dark and mysterious loch, its waters black as night. Here, the guardian was a creature of legend, a kelpie, a water spirit known for its cunning and treachery. The kelpie appeared to them as a beautiful horse its mane dripping with water, eyes glowing with an unearthly light. To claim the stone, they had to confront their deepest fears, as the Kelpie conjured illusions that preyed upon their minds and hearts. Lachlan saw visions of his clan in ruin, his people suffering because of his absence. Ewan was haunted by the specter of failure and dishonor to his family. Together, they had to face these fears head-on, grounding themselves in their friendship and shared mission. They spoke words of encouragement to each other, reinforcing their trust and determination. 
by breaking the Kelpie's illusions, they proved their courage and integrity, earning the third stone. With each stone they acquired, Lachlan and Ewan grew closer, their bond forged in the crucible of shared trials and triumphs. The relics they sought were more than just artifacts. They were keys to understanding the deeper connections between the land, its history, and its people. Lachlan learned to respect the ancient spirits and the wisdom they guarded, realizing that his quest was as much about inner growth as it was about finding a way home. Their journey was far from over, but Lachlan felt a renewed sense of purpose and strength. He had come to see the Highlands not just as a place of danger, but as a land rich with magic and history, a land that demanded respect and understanding. With Ewan by his side, he knew they could face whatever challenges lay ahead. The quest for the magical stones was a journey of transformation, one that would shape their destinies and the fate of their clans. As the days passed and Lachlan MacLeod and Ewan Campbell gathered more of the mystical stones, the delicate balance of power in the Scottish Highlands began to shift. The quest that had once been shrouded in secrecy became a subject of whispered conversations in the halls of power. News of their journey spread like wildfire, igniting the ambitions of rival clans who coveted the stone's legendary power for themselves. The tension that simmered beneath the surface of the highlands erupted into open hostility, and Lachlan found himself at the heart of a brewing storm. The fragile peace that Lachlan had worked so hard to maintain was on the brink of collapse. He learned of a conspiracy among the rival clans, a sinister alliance formed with the intent to seize the stones and use their power to dominate the region. These clans, driven by greed and fear, saw Lachlan and his quest as a direct threat to their own ambitions. The realization that his mission now endangered not only his life, but the stability of the entire region weighed heavily on him. Determined to avert a full-scale war, Lachlan knew he needed a plan as daring as it was decisive. He convened a secret council with Ewan and a few trusted allies. Their discussions were intense. Each strategy weighed against the potential for success or disaster. The stakes were higher than ever, and Lachlan understood that he had to reveal the true power of the magical stones to unite the clans under a single banner. On the eve of the final battle, a violent storm descended upon the highlands. The winds howled like a chorus of ancient spirits, and rain lashed the land, turning the ground to mud. The atmosphere was electric with anticipation and fear. Lachlan stood before his gathered forces, the stones secured in a chest at his feet. His face was a mask of determination, eyes blazing with the resolve of a leader ready to make a stand. As the rival clans assembled on the field of battle, the air was thick with tension. Warriors shifted uneasily, their weapons glinting in the sporadic flashes of lightning. Lachlan knew this was the moment that would determine the future of the Highlands. With a deep breath, he stepped forward and raised his voice above the roar of the storm. Warriors of the Highlands, he began. 
his voice carrying through the tempest. We stand at a crossroads. The power of these stones is not meant for domination or destruction. It is a force that binds us to the land and to each other. We have the opportunity to forge a new path, one of unity and peace. With those words, Lachlan summoned the mystical force of the stones. He drew upon their energy, feeling it surge through him like a river of light. The stones glowed brightly, their combined power creating a beacon in the storm. As he raised his arms, the energy dispersed the thick fog that had cloaked the land, revealing the true beauty and strength of the Isle of Skye. The rugged peaks, lush valleys, and sparkling waters were illuminated. A vision of the land as it could be. The rival clans, awestruck by the display of power and Lachlan's vision, hesitated. The raw, elemental force of the stones was undeniable, and for a moment the battlefield was silent, save for the storm's fury. Lachlan's words and the undeniable power of the stones began to sway the hearts of the assembled warriors. One by one, the leaders of the rival clan stepped forward, laying down their weapons in a gesture of surrender and respect. We pledge our loyalty to you, Lachlan MacLeod, the leader of the largest rival clan declared, his voice carrying the weight of centuries of conflict and hope for a new beginning. Under your banner, we will strive for the peace and prosperity of the Highlands. With peace restored and the clans united, Lachlan felt a profound sense of relief and triumph. The journey had been arduous, filled with trials that tested his courage, wisdom, and resolve. But now, standing on the battlefield surrounded by his former enemies who had become allies, he knew the future of the Highlands was secure. Returning to the cave where his journey had begun, Lachlan carried the chest of magical stones. The cave, once a place of mystery and foreboding, now felt like a sacred sanctuary. The stones, glowing with a warm and steady light, seemed to pulse with approval. Lachlan placed his hand on the stone that had started it all, and in that moment, it offered him a vision of what was to come. He saw the Isle of Skye thriving under his leadership, the clans working together in harmony. The land was vibrant and prosperous, a testament to the power of unity and the wisdom of the ancients. The vision filled Lachlan with a deep sense of peace and fulfillment. He knew that the journey had been worth every hardship, every challenge. As he touched the stone once more, Lachlan felt the familiar sensation of being transported. The world around him blurred and shifted, and he found himself back in the present. The Isle of Skye was exactly as he had seen in his vision, flourishing, peaceful, and united. His clan greeted him with joy and respect, and Lachlan, now a wise and revered leader, knew that the magic and mysteries of Skye would always be a part of him. The fog that once symbolized uncertainty and danger had lifted, revealing a future filled with hope and promise. The stones had not only brought him home, but had transformed him into the leader his people needed. As he looked out over the land he loved, Lachlan MacLeod understood that the true power of the stones was not just in their magic, but in the unity and strength they had inspired. The 
legacy of the magical stones would endure. A beacon of hope for generations to come. And that, my dear listeners, was the fog of sky. Lachlan McLeod, with courage and determination, uncovered the ancient power of the mystical relics and united the clans of the Scottish Highlands under a banner of peace. His journey through treacherous terrains, facing ancient spirits and mythical creatures, revealed a leader who could harness the true strength of his heritage. So, remember, within every challenge lies the opportunity for greatness, and in every shadow, a story waiting to be discovered. If you enjoyed tonight's enchanting tale from the heart of Old Scotland, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you never miss a mystical story. What would you do if you found a magical stone? Would you seek its power or return to your time? Let us know in the comments below. Until next time, may you have sweet dreams and magical adventures every night. Dear listeners, tonight I invite you to journey with me into the heart of a mist-shrouded valley, a place where time stands still and legends come to life. Prepare to be transported to a realm of ancient magic and timeless courage as we uncover the saga of the Druid King's tomb. Settle in comfortably, close your eyes, and let the ethereal whispers of forgotten ages draw you into a tale of peril and wonder, where the bravery of two souls will decide the fate of a hidden world. The Tomb of the Druid King In the heart of a distant land, where the tendrils of time seemed to lose their grip, lay a valley steeped in ancient mysteries. The very air here was thick with the whispers of the past. A heavy, almost tangible mist that clung to everything it touched. This was no ordinary fog. It swirled and danced with a life of its own, as if each droplet of moisture contained the spirits of those long departed. This veil of enigma cloaked the tomb of the Druid King, a figure of legend whose very name evoked awe and reverence. Once, long ago, the Druid King's magic had woven the fabric of the world, bending nature to his will and shaping destinies with his powerful incantations. His reign was a golden era, a time of prosperity and balance, until his death transformed his final resting place into a sanctuary of secrets and potent arcane energies. For centuries, the valley remained untouched, a place whispered about in the hushed tones of lore and superstition. It was said that those who dared to disturb the king's eternal slumber would unleash forces beyond mortal comprehension, forces that could rewrite the very laws of existence. On a day faded by the stars, a treasure hunter named Marcus decided to venture into this forgotten realm. Marcus was not a man easily swayed by fear or legend. His life was a tapestry of daring exploits, woven with threads of courage and a touch of recklessness. Tales of his escapades filled the taverns and marketplaces, where his name was spoken with a mix of admiration and incredulity. But even Marcus knew that this journey would be unlike any other. The promise of unimaginable riches hidden away in the tomb of the Druid King, was a siren call he could not resist. 
Beside Marcus walked Elena, a scholar with an insatiable thirst for knowledge, especially of the arcane. Her life's work had been devoted to the study of druidic practices, ancient rituals, and the history of the forgotten king whose tomb they now sought. Elena's presence was a beacon of wisdom and caution, balancing Marcus's boldness with her meticulous understanding of the dangers they might face. She was not driven by the lure of treasure, but by the promise of uncovering artifacts and knowledge that could illuminate the mysteries of the past. As they made their way deeper into the valley, the fog seemed to grow denser, wrapping around them like a shroud. The further they ventured, the more palpable the air became with an eerie stillness. It was a silence so profound that it seemed to muffle their very thoughts, leaving only the sound of their cautious footsteps to echo through the void. Each step they took seemed to carry the weight of countless souls who had wandered these paths before, lost to the mists and the ages. The landscape around them was a desolate beauty, marked by twisted trees and ancient stones that stood like silent sentinels. The ground beneath their feet was soft and yielding, a dampness that spoke of centuries of undisturbed decay. Every now and then, the fog would part momentarily, revealing glimpses of a world long forgotten. The remnants of a forgotten civilization, overgrown and reclaimed by nature. These fleeting visions were like ghosts, ephemeral and haunting, hinting at the grandeur that once was. Marcus moved with a confidence born of experience, his eyes sharp and his senses heightened. He knew the value of caution. Even as his heart raced with the thrill of the unknown, Elena, on the other hand, was absorbed in the atmosphere around her, her mind racing with the possibilities of what they might find. Her hands brushed against the ancient trees, feeling the textures of their bark, trying to commune with the past in a way only she could understand. Despite the legends and the palpable tension, there was a serenity to the valley, a sense that it was a place out of time, untouched by the world beyond its borders. This was a realm where the veil between the living and the dead was thin, where the past and present coexisted in a delicate balance. It was into this twilight world that Marcus and Elena stepped, each driven by their own desires, yet united in their quest. As the fog thickened around them, they could feel the eyes of the past watching them, judging their every move. It was as if the valley itself was alive, a sentient entity that knew the hearts and minds of those who dared to enter its domain. Marcus and Elena pressed on, undeterred by the unseen gaze, their determination unshaken. They knew that to turn back now would be to admit defeat, and neither was willing to concede to the shadows of legend. The valley held its breath as they ventured further, its secrets waiting to be unveiled. The tomb of the druid king lay ahead, a beacon of mystery and power, calling to them through the fog. What awaited them within its ancient walls was a tale yet to be written, a story of courage, knowledge, and the timeless dance between light and darkness. From the very beginning, Marcus and Elena were met with challenges that tested their resolve 
and their courage. The foggy veil had been an eerie precursor, but nothing could have prepared them for the sheer force that awaited within the tomb itself. The moment they broke the ancient seal that guarded the entrance, a powerful wave of energy erupted from within, like a silent scream echoing through the ages. This energy was more than just a physical force. It was a call to all that lay dormant within the tomb, awakening ancient protections and dark curses that had been set in place to guard the resting place of the Druid King. As the stone door groaned open, releasing a rush of stale, cold air, the atmosphere around them seemed to shift. The temperature plummeted, and the dim light from their torches flickered, as if struggling to maintain their grip on reality. Marcus and Elena exchanged a glance, both aware that they had crossed a threshold from which there was no return. With a deep breath, they stepped into the darkness of the tomb. The smell of old earth and forgotten enchantment filled the thick, heavy air inside. The walls were decorated with beautiful inscriptions and sculptures that recounted tales of the Druid King's rule and the potent spells that had been constructed to guard his last resting place. The deafening quiet was broken as they descended down into the catacombs by the faint sounds of whispering, which sounded like the rustle of leaves in a far-off forest. These were the ghosts of those who had formerly worked for the king, voices from the past that had awoken and realized who was intruding. Without warning, the first of the vengeful spirits appeared, materializing from the shadows with a wail that pierced the silence like a knife. These spectral guardians, bound by loyalty and duty, were relentless in their attacks. Their ethereal forms flickering in and out of existence as they lunged at Marcus and Elena. Each strike was like a gust of freezing wind, sapping their strength and testing their will. Elena, with her extensive knowledge of druidic practices, fought to control the unleashed forces. She muttered incantations under her breath, her voice steady despite the chaos around her. Her hands moved with practiced precision, tracing symbols in the air as she attempted to calm the spirits and deactivate the traps that lined their path. But these were no ordinary spirits. They were imbued with the ancient magic of the druid king himself, and their fury was formidable. Magical traps, hidden within the very stones of the catacombs, activated with each step they took. Arrows of pure energy shot from the walls. Flames erupted from the ground, and shadows seemed to come alive, twisting and writhing with malevolent intent. Marcus used his agility and combat skills to dodge and counter these threats, while Elena focused on neutralizing the enchantments. Together, they moved as a unit, their combined strengths pushing them forward through the labyrinth of danger. As they delved deeper, the true magnitude of their task became clear. It was not enough to merely survive the attacks. They had to find a way to reseal the tomb, to contain the powerful magic that threatened to spill into the world. The Druid King's power, if unleashed, could fall into the wrong hands and bring about untold destruction. This realization hung heavy over them, adding a sense of urgency to their every move, 
the catacombs seemed endless, a maze of twisting corridors and hidden chambers. Each turn brought new dangers, and each step was a test of their resolve. The spirits grew more numerous, their attacks more coordinated, as if sensing the determination of the intruders. Elena's druidic knowledge was stretched to its limits as she invoked ancient spells to pacify the spirits and disable the traps. Marcus, ever the protector, kept a vigilant watch. His every sense attuned to the threats around them. His bravery was unwavering, but even he could feel the weight of the tomb's defenses bearing down on them. The deeper they went, the more he realized that this was not a simple quest for treasure. It was a battle for survival against forces that defied comprehension. Elena's struggle was both physical and mental. The ancient magic she wielded required immense concentration and strength of will. She drew upon every ounce of her training and knowledge. Her mind a whirlwind of symbols and incantations. The spirits responded to her efforts, some calming and retreating, while others resisted with a ferocity that spoke of deep, unyielding loyalty to their king. Despite the dangers that lay ahead, Marcus and Elena continued, because they believed that their goal was more important than themselves. They understood that the real struggle lay not in only surviving, but in defending the world against the mayhem that would break out in the event that the druid king's power got into the wrong hands. Their expedition through the tomb served as evidence of their bravery, tenacity, and unwavering spirit. As they ventured further into the heart of the catacombs, the air grew colder, the shadows darker, and the challenges more formidable. In the dim light of their torches, the walls of the catacombs seemed to stretch into infinity, an endless maze of shadow and stone. Each step Marcus and Elena took echoed with a hollow resonance, as if the very air around them held its breath. The journey thus far had tested their endurance and their wits, but the catacombs still held many secrets. It was during this exploration, when hope and determination hung in a delicate balance, that they stumbled upon a hidden passage, an unexpected doorway concealed behind a veil of illusionary magic. The entrance to the passage was subtle, almost imperceptible to the untrained eye. It was Elena's keen sense for magical anomalies that led them to it. She paused, her fingers tracing the faint outline of runes etched into the stone. Whispering an incantation, she felt the air shimmer and shift, revealing the hidden door. With a gentle push, it swung open silently, inviting them into the unknown. The passage was narrow and winding, its walls lined with ancient carvings that seemed to tell a story in a language long forgotten. The air here was different, carrying a sense of anticipation and an undercurrent of power. As they ventured deeper, the temperature dropped, and a strange luminescence began to emanate from the walls, casting an eerie glow that illuminated their path. At the end of the passage, they found a chamber, hidden from the world for centuries. It was a sanctuary, untouched by time, and shielded from the chaos outside. The chamber was adorned with symbols of the Druidic Order, 
and at its center stood a pedestal upon which lay an ancient manuscript, bound in weathered leather and inscribed with symbols that seemed to pulse with a life of their own. Elena approached the manuscript with reverence, her heart pounding in her chest. As she opened it, the pages crackled softly, releasing a faint scent of aged parchment and lingering magic. The manuscript was written by the Druid king himself, a testament to his wisdom and foresight. It contained detailed instructions on how to reseal the tomb, a complex ritual designed to bind the powerful forces within and protect the world from their potential wrath. But as they read further, they discovered more than just a guide. The manuscript held a dire warning. If the ritual was not performed correctly, an unknown power, more dangerous than anything they had encountered, would be unleashed. This power, hinted at in cryptic verses, seemed to be a force of pure chaos, capable of bending reality and wreaking havoc upon the world. Elena's eyes widened as she deciphered the ancient symbols and incantations. The manuscript was not just a set of instructions. It was a test, a measure of worthiness for those who dared to undertake the ritual. The Druid King had foreseen the possibility of his tomb being disturbed, and had crafted this test to ensure that only those pure of heart and strong of will could reseal the tomb. As they studied the manuscript, the hidden story of the Druid King began to unfold. Through the intricate symbols and poetic incantations, a tale of treachery and betrayal emerged. The king, once revered and beloved, had been the victim of a conspiracy, orchestrated by those who coveted his power. His closest advisors, driven by greed and ambition, had turned against him, leading to his untimely death. The Druid King's final act of defiance was to hide away a treasure of boundless power, a treasure that could only be revealed to those who proved themselves worthy through the completion of the ritual. This treasure, hinted at but never explicitly described, was said to hold the key to unimaginable magical abilities, capable of altering the very fabric of existence. Marcus and Elena realized the gravity of their discovery. They were not just treasure hunters or scholars on a quest. They were now the stewards of an ancient legacy, entrusted with a task that held the fate of the world in its balance. The responsibility weighed heavily upon them, but it also steeled their resolve. They knew that to fail would be to unleash untold horrors, but to succeed would be to preserve a power that could change the course of history. The hidden chamber, with its ancient manuscript and the revelations it held, became a turning point in their journey. It was no longer just about survival or the pursuit of knowledge. It was about proving their worth and fulfilling a destiny that had been written long before their time. The chamber's serene atmosphere belied the immense significance of what they had found, and as they prepared to leave, they felt a sense of purpose and determination like never before. With the manuscript in hand, they retraced their steps through the narrow passage, their minds racing with the knowledge they had gained and the challenges that lay ahead. The catacombs, once a place of darkness and danger, now seemed to pulse with a renewed energy 
as if the very stones themselves acknowledged the importance of their quest. Marcus and Elena emerged from the hidden passage, ready to face whatever trials awaited. Armed with the wisdom of the Druid King, and a newfound understanding of the true nature of their mission. The shadows of the catacombs stretched long and menacing as Marcus and Elena pressed onward. Time seemed to slip through their fingers like sand, and with every passing moment, the dangers they faced grew ever more formidable. Yet, the gravity of their mission bound them together, their combined resolve as unyielding as the ancient stone around them. Through twisting corridors and past traps, both magical and mechanical, they navigated with a sense of urgency that heightened their senses. Each obstacle they overcame, whether it was a spectral guardian or a hidden pitfall, honed their teamwork and sharpened their focus. The stakes were clear. To fail would be to unleash untold chaos, a responsibility neither of them took lightly. At last, after what felt like an eternity of struggle, they arrived at the heart of the tomb, the central chamber where the druid king's sarcophagus lay. This monumental room was vast, its high ceiling lost in shadow, its walls inscribed with the history and legacy of the Druid King. The air here was thick with magic, a palpable energy that thrummed like a heartbeat, filling the chamber with a sense of awe and reverence. Elena, clutching the ancient manuscript, stepped forward with a determined expression. She could feel the power radiating from the sarcophagus, a testament to the might of the Druid King, even in death. With a deep breath, she began the ritual to reseal the tomb, her voice steady as she chanted the incantations inscribed in the manuscript. Each word resonated with the magic that had been woven into the very fabric of the tomb, invoking the ancient protections meant to guard this sacred place. As Elena concentrated on the ritual, Marcus's attention was drawn to a glint of light from the corner of the chamber. Curiosity and the lure of discovery led him to a small, hidden doorway, cleverly concealed behind an ornate tapestry. Pushing it open, he found himself in a smaller chamber, filled with artifacts that sparkled with an otherworldly glow. This was the Druid King's treasure, a collection of items imbued with immense power. The allure of the artifacts was overwhelming, each one calling to Marcus with promises of wealth and power. Unable to resist, he stepped inside, triggering a series of ancient mechanisms. The ground beneath him shuddered, and a deep rumble echoed through the tomb as the chambers began to collapse. In the main chamber, Elena's chant faltered as the ground shook violently. A spectral figure materialized before her, the ghostly visage of the druid king himself. His eyes, filled with an ethereal fire, bore into Marcus, who stood frozen in the treasure room. The king's voice, though a mere whisper of its former power, was laced with stern rebuke. Greed has no place here, the druid king intoned, his words reverberating through the chamber. Only those pure of heart can wield the power contained within these walls. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Elena returned to the manuscript, her mind racing to complete the ritual. She understood that the Druid King's power was not meant for just anyone. 
it required a heart unclouded by selfish desires. Summoning all her strength, she invoked the final incantations, calling upon the ultimate protection written in the manuscript. Light began to fill the room, emanating from the sarcophagus and spreading outward like the dawn breaking over a dark horizon. The spirits, once restless and vengeful, retreated before the purity of the light, their anger pacified. The collapsing chambers ceased their violent tremors, and the ancient mechanisms ground to a halt. The magical energy coalesced around the sarcophagus, resealing the tomb with a barrier of light that shimmered with protective enchantments. The treasure room, too, was enveloped in this protective aura, safeguarding the artifacts from those unworthy to claim them. As the light subsided, Marcus found himself freed from the intoxicating allure of the artifacts. Clarity returned to his mind, and with it, a deep sense of shame for his momentary lapse. Elena's eyes met his, and in that shared glance, there was an unspoken understanding of the immense responsibility they now bore. They had been tested, and, through perseverance and a bit of fortune, had succeeded. Marcus vowed to keep the location of the tomb and its treasures a closely guarded secret, recognizing the dangers that such power could pose if it fell into the wrong hands. Together, they made their way out of the tomb, emerging once more into the fog-covered valley. The oppressive silence had lifted, replaced by a tranquil stillness that spoke of peace restored. As they walked away from the tomb, the weight of their journey settled upon them, but so too did a sense of fulfillment. They had not only survived, but had safeguarded a power that could have wrought great destruction. Their story, bound by the trials they had faced and the wisdom they had gained, would become a legend, a warning to all who might seek to disturb the peace of the Druid King. In the fog-covered valley, the tomb remained protected, its boundless power hidden away for eternity, a testament to the enduring legacy of the Druid King and the bravery of those who had honored his final rest. And that, dear listeners, was the tale of the Druid King's tomb. Marcus and Elena, through their courage and determination, have not only safeguarded ancient magic, but also preserved the delicate balance between light and darkness. Their journey through the misty veil and treacherous catacombs reminds us that true bravery lies in selflessness and wisdom. So remember, behind every mystery lies a story waiting to be uncovered, and in every heart, the potential for heroism. If you enjoyed tonight's mystical adventure, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you never miss a tale of enchantment and wonder. What would you do if you were in Marcus's shoes? Would you resist the allure of power or embrace it? Let us know in the comments below. Until next time, may you have sweet dreams and magical adventures every night. <laughs>